Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us for another Intensive Care Network, Western Australia. Um, our first webinar, actually. Um, we're doing this in conjunction with ANZIX, um, represented by Brad Wybrow tonight. Um, we're very lucky to have Caitlin Lamb with us today, um, one of the advanced heart failure and Caitlin's going to talk to us tonight about myocarditis and some of the case series with Caitlin with her. So, over to you, Caitlin. Hi. Thank you, Julian, for inviting me to join you guys uh, for this discussion. Fortuitously, in Western Australia and at Fiona Stanley, our cases of COVID have been relatively low. And as such, most of the information that we've obtained regarding what happens during the COVID infection has been through our lit, lit reviews and also social media during the crisis. But as most of you are aware, COVID-19 can cause significant resource allocations in the ICU setting. And it is estimated that up to 20% of COVID positive cases were requiring ICU admission, up to 6% had shock and up to 13% had, case, had a high case fatality rate. And of course, this varied according to the patient and the diagnosis of COVID that's occurred over the last few weeks slash months. These numbers were initially representative, representative of the Chinese cohort. What we do know though, is from a cardiac perspective, patients who had cardiovascular disease, hypertension or diabetes were significantly represented in the COVID-19 cohort. And this occurred initially in China, where we detected cardiovascular disease in up to 14% of the patients. And then it was re-represented amongst the Italians and also seen in the Americans. And this is slightly unusual in that in comparison to the previous experience with SARS and MERS, we can see... You there, Kevin. Can we just interrupt you there? Are you able to share your screen? Your slides aren't coming up there. Oh. Can we just interrupt you? Let me just... I thought we were on. Um... That's hmm. I might just go back out and come back in again because I'm not sure. Oh, two sixteen. Right, um, Caitlin. We'll, what we might do is we might press on with um, a second. Section, uh, the next section and then come back to you if that's okay. Um, sure. I'm not sure what happened. Okay. Oh, I'll try to find it again. All right. Apologies for the... <laughs> We're all learning here with this new, new world technology. Um, we might move on to um, Tom Price, um, who's um, speaking on behalf of Fiona Stanley. And what we're going to do tonight is, um, along with Tom, Andy Chapman, Jude Barath, and Brad Wybrow, and Ravi Sonawani, and we're just going to have a panel discussion. I'm trying to tease out some of the common themes um, between the hospitals. Um, you'll notice at the bottom of the Zoom window, there's a couple of functions. There's a QA and a function and a chat function. Um, please feel free to um, put your questions up there, and we'll, um, <coughs> Seb and I will try and moderate I mean, get those across to the relevant um, panellists. So, Tom, might get you to kick off. Cool. Thanks, guys. Um, Brent, do you mind popping up the first slide? So, guys, just whilst that's loading, I'm going to um, give you a brief overview now of our experience at Fiona Stanley, um, and then we will hopefully tease out some themes and have a chat amongst us with regards to... Um, 
what sort of things happened to us down there and lessons that we learned. So Brent, do you mind just flipping back to the first slide? Perfect. So we had three fish, um, eight patients in total, um, admitted from sort of the middle to the end of March through to April over a couple of week period. Um, the sort of median age was in the 70s. Um, we had a male predominance with a median BMI of 29. And as I'm sure was the case with most of the other sites in Perth, we had mostly cruise passengers um, with a mix from the Artania and the Ruby Princess. And we had two community transmissions. Um, comorbidities are prevalent in about three quarters of our patients. Interestingly, the illness severity um, with regards to their admission to ICU sort of correlates pretty much with some of the ICNARC data coming back from London with a sort of median in Apache of 16, um, a SOFA score median of five, and your Android risk of death scoring system coming in at about 10%, although it's hard to sort of extrapolate this given the sort of new disease that COVID is. Most patients came down to us with moderate oxygen requirement. Um, we took one patient off the Artania having had a respiratory arrest, but the rest were transferred from the respiratory ward on varying amounts of oxygen and a, also the admission with also being admitted if there was concerns about clinical progression. Their sort of laboratory pictures were consistent with severe COVID, um, high inflammatory markers, high HD dimers, and interestingly, most of them actually had normal troponins apart from one raised in someone who, in the patient who had the respiratory arrest. Three quarters of them came to us within 24 hours of hospital admission. So with regards to their management, we as a department made a sort of policy that we were going to intubate these patients on arrival to ICU and as a result we did not use non-invasive or high flow and it'll be interesting to hear the experiences because I know some other sites I think um, Brad at Charlie's you've used a bit of high flow and non-invasive in these patients but we did not. Um, the one patient came to us in pre, in, one patient came to us having been intubated pre-hospital, but the rest were intubated uneventfully by us. Um, most patients were fairly routinely ventilated. We used APRV in three patients, which would be fairly common practice anyway within our unit. And we used nitric in those same patients. Didn't need to prone anyone, um, and no patients received ECMO during the course of their illness. One patient was trackied um, relatively late in their illness at day 20 for um, really sort of safety factors. Their PF ratios were in the sort of moderate severity ARDS category, again, similar to the data coming out from ICNARC, and their compliance was sort of moderate with a median Murray score. I know it's not commonly used in Australia, but sitting at 2.7. Everyone needed basic cardiovascular support. Um, no one, to be honest, needed high dose beta press or anotropic support. It all seemed fairly low dose and probably related to um, sedation requirements. We had tachyarrhythmias in a couple of patients, um, one of which required a cardioversion. And one patient, interestingly, um, I'm sure Caitlin might expand it, it, developed a second degree heart block towards the end of their hospital stay and needed a PPM. Um, we didn't have any episodes of cardiac arrest and no patients required mechanical support. Everyone developed a bit of an AKI, but it tended to be on the more mild end, um, and we just needed to dialyze one patient. Anticoagulation, something I might just touch on a bit more shortly, but we did not detect any thrombotic complications in our patients, um, but two patients developed pretty marked hypercoagulable state requiring anticoagulation. So just moving finally on to the outcomes, we had a median duration of ventilation that was actually just over two weeks in the end. Um, which was probably longer than we initially anticipated. We had a length of stay coming in at about three weeks, the longest being up to 38 days, I think, and he was just been recently discharged from ourselves. Um, most patients took nearly four weeks to be formally cleared by ID of COVID. Um, we thankfully discharged all of our patients to um, out of ICU alive, I was saying that one patient's still there, but that slide's a bit old now. So yeah, they've all been discharged. Um, we haven't had any reported SAIs and we didn't have any failed extubations. Um, our bed pressure state was 
low, to be honest, in terms of throughout this experience. And we only ever had a maximum of six patients within our sort of 20 dedicated negative pressure rooms. Um, and thankfully, there were no cases of healthcare, healthcare worker um, acquired infection. So, Brent, if you can just flip on to the next slide. Um, we, it's sort of experience, we've learned a vast amount, and these are some of the themes that sort of teased out of what our experience has been in FISH with regards to managing these patients. With regards to the sort of restructuring of our department, there's the obvious um, infrastructure changes that we've done with changing some negative pressure rooms, all our surge planning, our workforce planning with lots of recruitment and um, purchasing of new equipment. But the most interesting thing really from our perspective has just been they've been long and slow to manage and it's been very resource intensive. Um, we've sort of had to evolve our management strategies as time's gone on as new sort of uh, new data's come out and it's been quite stressful in terms of relatively unknown medicine um, with limited-ish evidence base and we've sort of had to find our feet as we go along. We've found that routine procedures within our unit for the COVID patients have taken have been a big undertaking even doing simple things transfers intubations and things like tracheostomy um, have taken a lot of big undertaking with a lot of communication and planning for them um, and that's all kind of been balanced with the constant risk to staff um, which we've had to weigh up each minor or really relatively minor intervention has had to be balanced against the risks of healthcare worker infection and that's always played quite heavily and that's probably influenced our sort of not using non-invasive or high flow um, within, within with that in mind. We've tried to sort of change the way we've interacted in the department. We've sort of implemented a bit of social distancing um, with regards to we've changed handover, we've changed um, the way we've done things like teaching, we've gone online with regards to video conferencing, we've had visiting team restriction to our unit and we have um, employed sort of virtual ID ward rounds. So it's been lots of change, it's been you know, those sort of eight patients have consumed a vast amount of resource, but we've sort of, we've never been entirely stretched with it. Um, and sort of the big surge planning hasn't come under pressure to see whether or not they all, all these sort of methods and systems we built have, you know, are validated. Second thing I just wanted to touch on, and this is pretty relevant, and I'm sure there's going to be lots of comments from other sites is regards to what to do with anticoagulation in these patients. We know that there's lots of data coming out about DIC, about VTE risk, about the increased incidence of PEs in these patients. And we have definitely demonstrated hypercoagulability. You can see the rotem on the right of the screen from one of our patients was taken in the setting of a fibrinogen of 12 and a D-dimer of greater than 20. Um, and we have, although we've never demonstrated thrombotic complications in our patients, we haven't actually gone looking for them. We didn't do any CT imaging on any of them. Um, and in the setting of that sort of hypercoagulability, we did decide to anticoagulate two patients. One had coexistent AF. But I suppose the biggest thing which is interesting and seems to attract the most debate is what to do with the sort of intermediate anticoagulation strategy that's coming out of places like London who are using BD clexane based on D-dimer values, I think, of greater than one. Um, so we as a department haven't had a formal policy on it. It's been pretty individualized, but I'd be interested to see what other people have done with their um, cohort with regards to anticoagulation. Um, and just finally, before we move on, the extubation strategies have been interesting with us. We've had three patients who you would seem you would sort of traditionally classify as pretty high risk of failure of extubation they've been morbidly obese one in the bmis of 50s we they've all had long um, durations of mechanical ventilation they've all had difficult weans they've been you know respiratory disease osa and we have made a conscious decision as a department uh, not to use high flow or non-invasive and that might change with time um, we haven't had any failed extubations but again it would be interesting to find out what people's strategies have been with regards to bridging um, to 
extubation, um, whether or not people are using high flow in this setting and obviously the risks of the staff and the anxiety that that has. Um, but overall, the experience probably has been fairly positive in fish. We haven't tried to reinvent the wheel too much. We've tried to keep things simple and familiar, but it's been a learning process with regards to sort of adjusting our practice as time's gone on. So I don't know, Seven, Julian, whether or not you want to open it up to the others to have a chat about some of those themes. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for that, Tom. I will just mm. remind all the uh, attendees as well that uh, we do value your input. There is a Q and A. Ah, thank you very much. There is a Q and A function at the bottom of the screen uh, that we welcome your uh, questions, and we will put those to the panelists as well. Uh, firstly, I thought I might. Uh, Tommy mentioned something about the effect of uh, restructuring, and uh, Jude, I know that you had some uh, some experience of that. Um, that Jude did up particularly with uh, teaching, um, and also with TPN. So I thought I might throw it open to you first, and uh, and see what your uh, your experiences with the restructuring were. Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, we got the Artanian uh, cruise ship passengers, which I'll go through within my presentation. But um, I guess they, they quickly put the resources to test. Um, and the ICU itself was um, pretty full. And because our staffing numbers are, I guess, low, well, you know, lower than other centers, it, um, it actually was a good test to see how, you know, how fast resources are consumed. And normal day-to-day -day activities that you, we, we were responsible for had to be, um, I guess, put to other teams. So, um, for example, TPN, because of the roster we were running, we weren't able to do TPN on a normal basis. Um, so we gave that job up and the dietitians and pharmacists on the wards and the surgeons uh, ran that uh, part of it. We established teams, so we had an intubating team from an anesthetics, and we actually formed a proning team as well. With lots of patients, you find that although you think that you can do lots of stuff yourself in the intensive care unit, it's actually really good to outsource, outsource things as well. And those teams actually came in quite useful when you're on the floor in the COVID unit to have other teams doing other processes within the unit itself. Uh, thanks for that, Jude. Uh, my next point was going to be uh, to bring in Andy. Uh, Andy, I saw you uh, nodding furiously when we were talking about uh, intermittent uh, anticoagulation strategies. Uh, uh, did you have anything to say on that one? Oh, well, that, that and everything else, I think, a fantastic talk, Tom. I thought it was a really, really great summary. And I think a lot of the things you mentioned are very similar to the experience that we had at Royal Perth. Um, I mean, yeah, in terms of the anticoagulation, I think we're all kind of finding our feet a little bit, aren't we? Like, we, it's clear that there's some some degree of hypercoagulability it seems like there's certainly micro thromboses if not macro thromboses in a lot of different sites both within the lung and within other areas of the body and how much of that is part of just the, the you know the the ongoing process of covid and how much is 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 uh, relates to other things i think it's difficult i i think with the evolving sort of information that we got i certainly lean towards a higher level of anticoagulation um, and my first patient that I started to do that on was an obese lady. And so we, I, I started her on aspirin, given that she came in with a mild increase in TROP um, and then ended up putting her on BD Clexane at 40. But what we found was her 10A levels were consistently very, very her anti-10A levels were consistently very, very low. And we ended up, up, up titrating that several times up to, I think 80 BD was her, her final dose before she actually passed away. Um, and then I think since then, that's sort of been a, a pretty routinely adopted strategy. We haven't quite gone to full anticoagulation for everyone, um, but we're certainly knocking on the door of that. We're starting antiplatelet medications at the drop of a hat, really. Um, and then, you know, using, you know, 10A levels as a guide within the, the sort of with the awareness that maybe anti-10A levels aren't the best thing in the world, but they're kind of what we've got to go on. Can I just, can I just um, ask, is anyone you like taking much notice of D-dimer cutoffs with regards to whether or not to get it intermediate? We, we weren't. Um, I, I would say that the two patients we had who gave us the most worry of thromboses both had high D-dimer levels, but, you know, higher anyway, at, at mm. both admission and throughout their piece. I wasn't really looking at that as a specific, if it hits a certain level, I'm going to increase the anticoagulation. Um, and I think it's, it's very difficult to know exactly what you're targeting as well, isn't it? But, mm. um, but yeah. 
I don't know what other people had, had thoughts on that. Yeah, we, um, I, we didn't specifically look at D-dimers either, Tom, but um, certainly our ones that were more inflamed and we were more concerned had higher levels of D-dimers. And we, we ended up on something similar. Our chap was there for quite a while. We ended up on 60 BD of Clexane until he had a trachea and had some hemo a hemoptysis and we dropped that down to 60 daily. Um, now, Matt and some others put um, one of our haematologists onto this to, to sort of do a review for us to come up with sort of a hospital-wide policy. And she came back with not dissimilar to what the guidelines sort of around the sort of suggestion this 40 daily upper limit of normal could go to 40 BD. So in the end, we've just sort of said that we would routinely aim for about 40 BD and also check anti-10A levels as, as Andy was saying. Um, I did see, interestingly, in the New England Journal last um, this week, there was a, an article on um, about lupus anticoagulants in these patients. So mm. um, basically, the, they showed that there was an, a higher level of APTT, and compared to controls who've got higher levels of APTT, 91% of the patients had a lupus anticoagulant in the COVID co cohort. So I guess that's just a a reminder not to look at the APTT and think, oh, it's a bit high, I won't give this patient anticoagulants because they're probably the ones that do need it, at least. Um, but I think we, you know, I think we, sounds like we send it or, set it on something that was fairly similar to you guys. Um, Jude, I know you guys ended up finding a few PEs in some what Hawk said was some fairly innocuous reasons for CTPAs that they had on the ward, but Jude can probably comment on that a bit more. Can I ask as well, were you guys doing antiplatelets as well? We didn't, not routinely. No, we, we haven't in fish, to be honest, um, yes. implemented that. Yeah, so with, with the operation at Journal Up, I mean, luckily all of them had hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes, and heart problems. So most of the cohort in the ICU actually wore an antiplatelet, some were even on dual antiplatelets. So that took that thinking out of the matter. They definitely wore all um, hypercoagulable. So in addition to uh, you know, high D-dimers, high refrigerogen levels, the ones that were filtered, they clotted the filters off quite a lot as well. Um, all of them had, sorry, about eight or nine of them had acute kidney injury and whether that's due to, you know, the inflammatory process shock or some microthrombi in there as well, who knows. We didn't, we didn't um, I guess, go on the upper limit of anticoagulation, so we stuck with the normal prophylaxis um, in these guys plus they were already on their antiplatelets. So we didn't put, we didn't think that it was useful to add anything at that stage. Because I mean, it's, it, it's an evidence-free zone at the moment. So we thought, you know, just go basic. If we think they do have clots, yes, sure, we'll anticoagulate them. Logistically to scan any of them would be a nightmare. The ones who were scanned, so there were three who ended up having proven PEs. There were two on the wards who never came to intensive care. And there was one who was in intensive care, but he was only scanned after he was extubated and sent to the ward. Um, both of them had, oh, sorry, three of them, they, they all had um, decent clot burden, to be honest, but no RV strain, but they had clots everywhere throughout. Uh, Jude, I'll just uh, throw in one question here from the audience. And from, uh, by the way, uh, Ashish, Adam and George, uh, your questions will be covered in later talks. So uh, we haven't forgotten about you, but... Um, another question was uh, for you, Jude. Have any of your patients been sent home on anticoagulation? And if so, what did you use for that? Um, look, after they, after they went to the ward, I actually don't know what happened. I mean, they've gone back to Germany. So I'm not sure exactly if they were sent home or anything or not. I, I hope they had anticoagulation then. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't have that data in front of me. I mean, the Germans seem pretty tough, who knows? Uh, but yeah, so uh, I don't have that, that information. The one, who is, um, the one who was in ICU, he's actually still on the wards. Um, he hasn't gone home yet because of a complication that I'll talk about in, in my talk. And he's still on anticoagulation, yeah. Awesome. One, of, one of our patients... Oh, sorry, Ravi. One of our patients uh, actually developed upper limb DVD and uh, had a baseline ejection fraction of less than 30%. So we actually use that as an excuse to start on therapeutic anticoagulation uh, when we are really desperate in our treatment plan. Uh, with the coincidence, the patient did show improvement later on, but we don't know, you know whether that worked or we did something else as well.
Uh, next topic I was just going to bring up uh, that, that Tom mentioned was the the, uh, uh, the problems with extubation that I think you've all had. Um, uh, and I might throw that open to, uh, to Brad first with the problems with failed extubation. Well, we are, um, because we use high flows, we didn't actually need to intubate many patients. No, I'm just joking. Um, no, I, um, we only extubated one patient, so I'm not sure I could really talk with any authority on that. And to be honest, um, he was quite delirious and we, um, I guess half of us thought he would fail and half of us thought he would thrive and he did thrive. So that's, uh, that's about all I could say on extubating them. No, well, can, can I just quickly, with regards to, there's been a few reports of upper airway edema and swelling in these patients and whether or not to check for cuff leaks. Obviously the AGP risk is fairly high, but towards the you know, latest stages, is it, what's the people's general opinion on it? Is it a risk worth taking in, the, in terms of trying to identify those that are going to fail through airway edema? We didn't, I don't think, routinely check for cuff leak, but we had thrashy patients ventilated for a long time. So I just wondered if, has anyone had encountered problems with that or have you been checking for cuff leaks? I guess I'm not sure what I'd do if I found a cuff leak because yeah, like, so they've already been intubated for two weeks. I'm probably going to pull the tube anyway, to be honest. And that's, that, that, that was my thinking as well. So I extubated three personally. And um, that was a question from some of the juniors to me at, in the, at the bedside. Should we check for a cuff leak? And I was like, no, if I don't get a cuff leak, I'm still going to pull the tube because I think they're ready. So they've been on the ventilator for a long while. We'll get to the mm. point of considering tracheostomy later on. Um, but I thought either way they're ready and I think they should be okay. I know there was the, you know, the write up of about airway edema and stuff like that, but, um, I thought I'd just pull the tube regardless. Perfect. Um, thank you everyone for um, all the, um, uh, awesome chat so far. Um, we might just move back to Dr. Caitlin Lamb. Um, so Brent, if it's possible just to bring up, um, Dr. Lamb's slides. Perfect. Okay, then I suspect you're um, still on mute then. Hi. We, <laughs> great, we have screen and we have audio. Perfect. Are we all set? Let's do it. Awesome, thank you. Take two. <laughs> So COVID-19 COVID is a predominantly respiratory infection. And um, I think we also have come to appreciate it can affect multiple systems. And one of the systems that has been shown initially to be affected has been the cardiovascular system and the myocardium. It's also as it also contributes to the significant ICU admission, the incidence of shock, and the high case fatality rate. Next slide. Thank you. I think throughout the world, in China, in Europe, and in America, there has been a significant association between cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and the and its prevalence in um, COVID-19. For you guys who are looking after patients who are in ICU, it comes of no surprise that most influenzas and most viral infections are associated with an increased incidence of these comorbidities. Next slide. However, what is quite interesting is the significant case fatality that's associated with COVID-19 in comparison to the other significant viral pathologies. If we compare the case fatality rate of COVID-19 in patients who have cardiovascular disease, the patients have an odds ratio, according from data accumulated from the Chinese CDC, of over 13, an odds ratio of 13, uh, 13 for the risk of death. And if you compare this to patients who have influenza, this is only twice the, death, the case of death. When you compare it to SARS-CoV-1, the rate has increased, but it's still significantly higher at 9.2. 
And this is quite surprising because when you compare the case fatality of cardiovascular disease in patients who have COVID-19 versus those who have lung disease or cancers, you can see the ratios is still, still significantly more significant. Next slide. So when we looked at the patients who had cardiac injuries, what did we see? And the initial Chinese studies had suggested that there was a significant association between the presence of cardiac injury and what happened to the patients in terms of their prognosis and the course through the hospital. One of the largest cohort studies was uh, performed, which looked at over 400 patients. And this showed that cardiac injury, as defined by the presence of an abnormal or elevated troponin, occurred in 20% of patients who were hospitalized. For those patients who actually experience cardiac injury, there was a significant risk of death in comparison to those who had normal troponins. Patients who had an elevated troponin were, had also a higher incidence of ARDS, acute kidney injury, hypoproteinemia, and coagulation. Patients who had an elevated troponin had a 51% risk of death versus 4.5% if there was no elevated troponin. Once again, we're not... Previous slide, please. Great, thank you. This shows an association, but it does not show a causative factor. Next slide. What is interesting though, is patients also who had an increased incidence or higher rate of troponins showed an increased risk or increased association with D-dimer, interleukin-6, lymphocyte count changes, serum ferritin, lactate dehydrogenase, all the factors that have been shown to be associated with a pro-inflammatory state. The second series, which looked at 191 patients, showed that the incidence of acute heart failure symptomatically was associated also with an increased risk of death. The increase in the troponin was often seen within the second week. Next slide. The etiology regarding the, uh, the viral interaction with the cardiovascular system has postulated to arise between the interaction with the ACE2 receptors which are expressed along the alveolar cells, but also along the parasites in the cardiovascular system. And it's thought that the interaction between the ACE2 receptors plus the serum protease receptor leads to the, um, I guess, the entry of the virus into the cells and the resultant viral replication within the cells. It, is, it was postulated that patients who actually had Hyper, uh, or were on antihypertensive therapies with ARBs and ACE inhibitors had an increase in the expression of these ACE2 receptors, which may have, which may have increased the risk of the viral entry into their, in, into their um, parasites and into the lungs and thus increase the risk of the, the infections. However, to date, there's no convincing data to show this. Next slide, please. The cause for how the virus actually affects and how the COVID infection affects the cardiovascular system arises firstly from the infection of the parasites, that is the endothelial cells along all the lining of the blood vessels. The same process which affects the endothelial cells can cause coronary artery occlusion and through an inflammatory process, that is a vasculitis, which has been demonstrated. This causes microvascular dysfunction and can thus affect the cardiac system. In addition, it can cause macrovascular endothelial dysfunction, which can potentially cause cardiac spasms, plaque instabilities and ruptures. There've been several case reports for patients who have significant ST elevations on their ECGs and yet normal coronary angiograms. And this can be a postulated explanatory mechanism. In addition, there's also the inflammatory process that has been widely described. The pro-inflammatory cytokine results from the activation of T cells and macrophages 
the cytokine storms were re releasing the interleukin-6, 7, um, and all the other immunofactors which can cause either plaque instability or can directly affect the myocardial cells. We also know that the macrophage systems can also cause immune activation, which can then attack the myocardial cells and cause a form of myocarditis, which can then affect the myocardial fibers and cause a troponin leak and systemic dysfunction. All of the resultant direct effect on the heart can then lead to the myocardial dysfunction, which results in the clinical symptoms of heart failure or the clinical instability associated with cardiac arrhythmias. Next slide, please. This slide shows the first reported case of uh, a definitive presence of inflammatory cells within the myocardium. And this is from um, April. This patient was a 43-year-old lady who came in with some shortness of breath and chest pain. Her ECG showed the initial ST elevation that you can see in leads 2, 3 and AVF. Um, the CT chest had shown she had the uh, nodular changes. It's consistent with the pulmonary involvement. The cardiac MRI shows you can the significant increased thickness of the LV walls, consistent with edema, which is demonstrated. And the ejection fraction was mildly reduced at 43%. Within the myocardium, what was seen was inflammatory cells, and these are lymphocytes that you can see, uh, these are little blue dots within the myocardial fibers. The increase in the white space around the myocardium represents edema. So this represents a case of myocarditis as confirmed um, for the first time of having the inflammatory cells within the myocardium. You can see the troponin and the BNP also increasing during this case. This patient had resolution of her symptoms within two weeks and her LV function returned to normal. Next slide, please. This study or, uh, and electron microscopy shows the etiology um, of the parasite damage. So this is a case of endothelitis and the explanation for perhaps why patients have been experiencing significant coagulation disorders. This represents the um, sort of these round circles with sort of like the dense black centers, the dense black perimeters and the uh, echolucent centers are virion particles and they are occurring within the first slide um, within the glomerular, uh, glom the glomerular um, capillaries. This second panel in panel B, you can actually see that this is actually the basement membrane is uh, within the glomeruli. And you can see that within the actual walls, you can see the virions here. When we go into the gastrointestinal system, this is a blood vessel that's been sectioned. And you can see along the blood vessel walls, you have the, inflam the inflammatory cells. This is a more typical picture. This is an arterial, which is in the lung and you can see the cross-sectional arterial and having the inflammatory cells around um, the endothelial layer. Next slide, please. So we understand some of the um, pathomechanisms associated with the COVID infections. And the question that arises for us then is how do we treat it? Fortuitously at Fiona Stanley, we haven't actually been involved with any cases of significant myocarditis. And I've asked my colleagues, um, you know, within the heart failure team and within cardiology to see if they've actually had significant involvement. And I think we came up with potentially two patients and I think we'll sh I'll show the slide at the end. But I wanted to show this slide of the empty streets of New York to show two things. First of all, to show the paucity of people within New York is representative of the, of the paucity of data we have regarding the treatment of COVID-19 and cardiac injury. The information that I'm going to be sharing with you regarding its treatment is going to be based predominantly upon a very few selected case series or case reports, which are then of course subject to um, selection bias. So most 
of the reports regarding this treatment is going to be based upon what we do with formin or how we manage formin myocarditis in the non-COVID setting. And in this setting, like there is in America, there are very strong camps who have very strong opinions. And this revolves around the use of immunomodulation. Next slide, please. So overall in cases for, of formin myocarditis, if we look at the categories where we consider what causes myocarditis, there is a generalized autoimmune phenomenon. And within this category, we have giant cell myocarditis and sarcoidosis, Kawasaki celiac disease. And these are the conditions that we typically deal with in the adult world that can be treated with immunosuppression. I have highlighted this, in this initial box because there has been an association and discussion of Kawasaki disease um, incidences amongst children in the, in the United States and some in Europe. Secondly, uh, toxic, so things that patients consume or things that we give to patients can potentially cause an inflammatory cardiomyopathy. Hydroxychloroquine would probably come into this category and the Americans were using a lot of this. So when we read the information about myocarditis in America, we have to take this into consideration. And lastly, the list of potential viruses and infections that can cause inflammatory cardiomyopathy. Um, the enteroviruses Coxsackie um, shares some very similar um, pathological reactions that we're seeing with COVID, parvovirus virus B19, and of course, influenza. These are the list of, of viruses that we typically check for when patients come in with a fulmin myocarditis of unknown cause. Next slide, please. And when the patient does come in with formant myocarditis to potentially involve ICU, we're often asked to work out how we should manage these patients. And one of the questions that initially comes up with, or that we are often asked, or we often ask ourselves, what is the cause of this virus or this formant myocarditis and how can we treat it? And as I will show you, a lot of the treatment for formant myocarditis predominantly revolves us using immunosuppression or no immunosuppression. I know a lot of this has been predominantly based upon the biopsy findings in our, our centres. So the question about whether to do a bio, biopsy or not to help guide us immunosuppression is based upon the patient's mecha or mechanical surgery instability. If the patients are hemodynamically unstable or require inotropic support, or show significant arrhythmias that would su suggest a high form of myocarditis, we would often, in the non-COVID state, proceed to endocardial myocardial biopsy, and that is so that we can establish whether we should use significant immunosuppression. Patients who are hemodynamically stable do not proceed to having a biopsy and often treated conservatively. They will then proceed to either having a cardiac MRI to confirm that they've got edema and inflammation and then be commenced on the appropriate supportive therapies. And this occurs because we, we know that 50% of all viral myocarditis resolve and patients' LV function return back to normal. Next slide, please. So the initial medical treatment for patients who have the COVID myocarditis, first of all, first of all involves the decision regarding immunomodulators. And I will go through some of the list of the pro versus the anti-immunomodulators. But typically, the immunomodulators that have been described would, be, would include the use of steroids, hydrocortisone or methylprednisolone, intravenous immunoglobulin, thymoglobulin in China, and human serum. Also, the use of anti antivirals. In the case reports that I've read to date, patients all had used lopinavir and ritonavir. However, the most recent uh, studies from the New England Journal would suggest that there's been no benefits of lopinavir and ritonavir, and subsequently, it's hopeful that remdesivir will be the protease inhibitor will replace this as a potential antiviral agent. And we will discuss this in a later slide. Lastly, one of the most hopeful um, immunomodulators that we have, that we could potentially use, are the interleukin-6 inhibitors. And I have listed three of them. Those three are currently in clinical trials for COVID in the United States, and they're all used for different arthropathies. 
Tocilizumab is probably the most um, commonly recognized in, in the literature. And it's hopeful that these medications can ameliorate the cytokine storm and thus reduce the damage to the systemic system. There has been one successful case report on the use of tocilizumab in myocarditis and associated COVID to date. Next slide. Steroids. Why would we not want to use steroids in patients who have COVID myocarditis? As I said previously, 50% of acute myocarditis undergoes spontaneous, spontaneous healing. And we know that steroids are bad for infections. And we also have shown that early glucocorticoid therapy, therapy has not been proven to be effective in acute myocarditis. But conversely, it has also been shown not to cause harm. So in the largest systemic review to date, we had looked at over 719 patients and we showed no mortality benefit or impairment. However, in little mice, we have shown that glucocorticoids can exacerbate acute murine viral myocarditis. And we look at, when we looked at some COVID cases in China, the initial data had suggested that if patients were using corticosteroids, they had a higher rate of mortality. But it could also be that the patients who actually received corticoids were a lot sicker and were thus more subjected to higher risk complications. Next slide, please. Why do we want to use, potentially use steroids? The PROCAMP. The beneficial effects of steroids has been demonstrated in, in a significant subset of fulminant myocarditis patients. In giant cell myocarditis, in eosinophilic myocarditis, and in acute cardiac rejections, we have shown that fulminant myocarditis is being, has or is treated effectively with steroids. In China, in one of the first cases we were looking at the incidence of survivors of ARDS, it actually showed that patients that actually used methylprednisolone had an increased risk of, or had an increased chance of survival versus no methylprednisolone. And in all cases of reported myocarditis in COVID patients, there was reported use of steroids. Next page, please. Intravenous immunoglobulin. The use of intravenous immunoglobulin was significantly higher in those patients who had died um, with COVID in the initial cohort studies. But once again, this was not, we weren't, uh, it was unclear as to whether IV was actually used in significantly sicker patients and thus a high mortality rate. What is interesting though is the use or the association of IV and Kawasaki disease. Kawasaki disease, which is a medium vessel vasculitis, which affects young children and is the most common acquired cardiac disease in the world, has been um, found to be occurring amongst COVID children. And the treatment for Kawasaki disease has been shown to be effective of using intravenous immunoglobulins. So it's, um, this is a potential indication in terms of the mechanism of the vasculitis that can be occurring in COVID cases, and perhaps an indication that we should consider using IV as part of the standard treatment for patients who do have a profound inflammatory state. It's interesting to note regarding Kawasaki disease. So Kawasaki disease is um, you know, a typical prodrome Febrile illness uh, for children who are lasting for longer than five days. They typically have mucosal changes, um, a skin rash, um, mucosal changes within their eyes to cause uh, conjunctivitis and desquamation of their hands. And interestingly, in the cardiovascular system, they have these large um, aneurysms which can be formed. The infections of affecting the blood vessels within these patients often can last a lifetime and up to 10 to 20 percent of patients are actually resistant to intravenous immunoglobulins. It has been shown to have a seasonal variation to suggest a viral incidence and interestingly enough patients there may be a genetic component to this because patients who move from um, Northeast Asia to the United States remain continue to have the higher risk of having this Kawasaki disease. 
And this genetic slash um, genetic variation may explain the difference in the disease occurrence and disease of severity that we're seeing throughout the world and the geographical differences. Next slide. Brimdesivir. So this is a chain terminator RNA um, virus polymerase. It's interesting in that with the Chinese initially, um, the initial trial was performed in China and it had enrolled 200 patients, but it didn't, uh, the trial did not attain sufficient patients to develop um, statistical significance. There was some suggestion that it may reduce the duration of the severity of illness, but in the end, the conclusion was that there was um, the potential harm of this medication in terms of hepatic toxicity outweighed the small benefit in the reduction in the illness duration. Next slide. However, within 24 hours of this being released to the Lancet, apparent, um, the NIH released their communication, which I believe has not been published, which suggested that remdesivir actually improved uh, recovery time. There was no change or there's no benefit in terms of the mortality rate. Next slide. We move on to mechanical support for patients who have COVID myocarditis. What happens when medical therapy fails? Mechanical support is extremely resource intensive. I don't have to tell you guys that. And as yet, there is no definitive, um, there is no definitive guidelines as to the role of VA ECMO. We do know that the decision to initiate therapy will be dependent upon the availability of resource, the perceived benefit to the patient, and the risk of disease transmission to the staff. It has been suggested that we should use VA ECMO in a very highly selected case of patients who have refractory cardiogenic shock and not mixed shock. So that's not due to sepsis or the inflammatory systemic response. And this is achieved by using a combination of both hemodynamic data and echocardiographic evidence of biventricular failure. Next slide, please. This panel of graphs shows the experience of ECMO within Europe. Surprisingly enough, this is the most, late, the most latest information I could obtain, and that was the data obtained on the 2nd of May. There have been over a thousand cases of patients who've been on VA ECMO in Europe, around about 5% of those, sorry, VV um, ECMO. Of that, 5% have been on VA ECMO and 90% have been on VV ECMO. When we look at the status of what has happened to those patients in terms of mortality rate at this current time, 25% of patients have uh, succumbed on ECMO. There's around about 30% patient survival rate. And if we look at the patient characteristics, if I move this out of the way and you can look at the last column, you can see that the mean age of the patients who've been commenced on ECMO is relatively young at, eight, at age 52. The maximum age though has been in the late 70s. And this has been a significant predominance of males who've been on VA, on VV, on ECMO full stop. Next slide, please. One of the questions that was asked um, was regarding the sensitivity of COVID PCR. So if a young patient came in and had signs of myocarditis, could the patient have um, could the patient have a COVID infection even though the first COVID test was negative? And the answer to that is yes. And the data that I could use to um, answer this is based upon a radiology study in China of over a thousand patients. And that showed that the sensitivity of the initial first PCR test in comparison to CT imaging was around about 60%. In the patients who initially were um, negative to, to PCR swabs and positive to um, abnormal changes in the CT chest, 75% of those patients were later changed to being having um, a positive PCR test on the nasal swabs. 
Next slide, please. And this table showed the results of what happened to the patients who had sequential testing on the um, PCR. You can see that patients, um, this is 256 patients of the one of the over 1000 patients in the trial. You can see most of the patients, 80% of the patients just had two tests done. And patients within a week could change between a, a positive to a, a negative result or go from a negative result to a positive result. So I think what this table and the information shows is that the initial stat PCR can be relatively low, low, has low accuracy. And that is why I think lots of our patients have two or three PCR tests in the system to confirm the diagnosis. Next slide, please. So when we initially looked at this information whilst I was skiing in Whistler, I was a little bit concerned about the number of COVID cases that was, um, I was reading about in China and the Americans started showing that. And so when I came back and um, I spoke to Laurie and um, Sarah about the COVID cases, we thought maybe we should actually start looking for cardiac involvement at a relatively early stage. And so this algorithm was put together to try to understand and try to um, acquire the information regarding cardiac involvements in the patients who are going to have COVID. I must admit, I had thought a lot more patients would be um, arriving to our doors with COVID. And I'm very happy that that hasn't been the case. So um, next slide, please. So in the last couple of weeks, what I thought we'd do is go back and do an audit at Fiona Stanley and just to see how many patients actually did have cardiac involvement and what sort of cardiac testing have we done on our patients. I think Tom showed um, the history of what happened in the eight ICU patients. And it, sorry, in the eight ICU patients at Fiona Stanley Hospital. I think I've got the information from um, um, up to the six ICU patients. But at Fiona Stanley overall, so all of the inpatients at Fiona Stanley had an average age of 59 years. Um, for the 18 patients, I think six were in ICU, eight were in ICU, and uh, six were in ICU when I was looking at this, and one patient had died. When we looked at the um, troponins that were performed, only two thirds of the patients actually had a troponin at some stage, and around about 17% to 20% of the patients had an elevated troponins. And there were two patients who were both males, who were, one was 78 and one was 80. Both of them were in ICU. Of the 18 patients, half of them, or yeah, just a bit more than half had ECGs. Of those ECGs, more than half were abnormal. And around about half of the patients actually of, uh, or sorry, one, three of the patients actually had significant arrhythmias, which were either heart block, atrial fibrillation, or sinus bradycardia. There was only one toe performed in those 18 patients. At Royal Perth, Julian was very kind enough to actually have a look at the Royal Perth numbers, and I just did a quick count. Um, so the Royal Perth patients were slightly older than the Fiona Stanley patients. More, there was a high number of troponins performed at Royal Perth, and Similar to what we're expecting in the data, around about 25% of the patients actually had elevated troponins. So this is the cardiac experience so far from Western Australia in comparison to the lit reviews that I was discussing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Um, just in the interest of time, I think we might um, just um, aim to have just five minutes of questions. Um, the first is, a, I suppose, a pragmatic one. Um, Let's say we're working in another um, hospital, um, not at Fiona Stanley. Um, at what point um, would you, as the, I suppose, referral centre for advanced heart failure, um, at what point would you like to know about someone with um, suspected COVID myocarditis? I think um, if we look at the algorithm, I think if the patients are young, and show significant troponin elevation that's been associated with a poorer prognosis, 
or significant cardiac dysfunction on, the, on, on an echocardiogram, I think that places them at significant risk. And I think they're the patients that you probably want to close your observation. Okay. Um, and just one from um, Dr. Ashish. Um, he's um, sort of noted that you've talked about some of um, the potential treatments for um, inflammatory myocarditis associated with COVID-19, namely steroids and immunomodulation. Um, do you see any role for, I suppose, early or prophylactic use of these therapies in those um, considered to be at high risk? No, I think it's, um, I, I personally um, think that immunomodulators are associated with significant risks and that's why you have such strong camps where, you know, very much like the you know, Republicans and the Democrats in the United States, you have similar views about immunosuppression in the setting of this a viral infection. And I think it's, it, the feeling is, and I think it's warranted that patients still have sepsis, they still have an infection that they have to clear. So to give patients immunosuppression without them clearing the infection may, may place them at risk. And that goes against what we're supposed to do and that we're not supposed to harm patients in the first place before we um, can actually give treatment to benefit them. Perfect. Um, I might just pass it over to anyone on the panel. Are there any sort of um, questions for Caitlin? Yeah, I guess um, you sort of touched on a little bit, Caitlin. Uh, we, we did see a few patients, a few young patients with um, cardiomyopathy that had cruise ship exposures and I think Jude you also had on a June lot they thought would have to be COVID that turned out not to be um, and I guess whether you guys have thought about we don't really have access to serology testing yet but I just wonder wonder whether they could have could have been COVID and not had much of a been through their respiratory illness I just wasn't sure whether you've received more patients like that over this period you know, it's that we haven't received any patients regarding COVID. We've had, I know that we've been had consults regarding the COVID cases, potential COVID cases. And I think that was why um, I was, I came across, well, I was, oh, I had to do that um, review regarding the sensitivities for the PCRs. And I must admit, it surprised me that it was so low. You know, we're, <laughs> considering we've been, you know, at industry, we're asking patients and forming, you know, treatment decisions based on this PCR that potentially has a sensitivity pickup rate of only 60%. So I think what the suggestion would be um, in the literature has been that if you have a high suspicion that the patient is COVID positive and you need to do multiple swabs and whether you, you do the multiple swabs within a few days or, or a week apart, because if that's going to potentially impact how you sort of like treat the patient and also the potential for the staff at the hospital in how you um, allay PPE. Yeah, I think there's sensitivity that the test itself is good. It's just that whether or not the virus is there. So we've certainly seen that as well, that, um, you know, early when you've got upper respiratory tract symptoms, probably the PCR is sensitivity is close to high 90s. It's just that once the virus has moved and it's, no longer in the upper respiratory tract and it's down the lower respiratory tract, you really need some samples there. And that's why I just wonder, you know, we, well, luckily we haven't seen these patients, but if you did have a myocarditis that's four or five weeks down the track, your PCRs probably aren't going to be positive. Well, the, the track records with how we detect viral PCRs within myocardial biopsy samples is fairly low. And it has low sensitivity in terms of its detection and also low specificity. So we don't routinely um, perform viral PCRs or genomes within the myocardium or you know, even form non-COVID cases. Caitlin, we've just got one from Jeff Dobb at Royal Perth. Um, Jeff's asked if there's any association between troponin rise uh, or, or, and other indicators of myocarditis and microvascular thrombosis. Yep, that's a, you know, that's, a, that's a great question. I think the association between the coagulation disorders and I think I, I showed one of the graphs um, which showed, I think, LDH going up, D-dimer going up associated with troponin as well. Um, 
if we look at the instance of, let's say, if we look at Kawasaki disease and what happens with that, the thrombosis occurs within the luminal walls um, and may or may not actually become intraluminal. Um, so I think my suspicion is that it's an endothelitis, so it's going to cause damage to the blood vessels and maybe that's why it's so extensive and it's acting in a similar way to what we see when we have um, vascular rejection of the myocardium. Very hard to pick up to diagnose because of its scattered approach. But if all the parasites, if, if all you can imagine, if all the lining along the blood vessels walls could protect, potentially be affected by this virus, there could potentially be spots where you have inflammation and thrombosis occurring. I'm not sure if that answers um, Professor Dobbs' question. I think so. <laughs> um, Caitlin, thank you very much for um, taking your time, um, especially after your busy clinic this afternoon, to um, chat to us all. Um, we might move on to um, Andy from Royal Perth, um, just to share some of his experiences there. We, we, yeah, sure. We'd really love to clap, but it might be a bit weird. Not weird for me. Go for it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, hi guys. So I'm Andy. I'm one of the intensivists at Royal Perth. Um, so I haven't got quite such lovely presented data, but uh, we only had four patients come through intubated through the ICU. As you saw in a previous slide, there's about 30 odd have come through the hospital all in truth. So I thought I'd just run through them very, very quickly and just pull out a few things. So the, the first patient we had through was a 70 year old lady. Uh, they were all cruise ship related. One was a cruise ship worker, all the others were cruise ship passengers in their late 60s and early 70s. Um, she was pretty morbidly obese. She had a BMI of 44, as I remember, uh, and was hypertensive. Now she was really sick when she got to the hospital. She was our first case and we'd gone through all this sort of planning to bring people up to the ICU and intubate them in the ICU. But she had sats in, the, I think, either low 70s or high 60s when she got to um, ED and everyone understandably on seeing those numbers sort of freaked out and, and she had an emergency intubation downstairs. Um, she got put on APRV almost immediately for again for severe hypoxia and onto nitric very early as well. And then she just really proceeded to just slowly flame out. She, she had progressive worsening hypoxia despite everything we did. We proned her and initially seemed, I, th I hadn't done a lot of proning prior to that. And then we proned her and sort of saw immediate benefit in her oxygenation. I thought, oh great, that's that we've stopped this process. But when we flipped her back, she the next day she just deteriorated back to where she was and worse before. Um, she became persistently febrile. She went on, developed sort of quite late multi-organ failure, really only in the last sort of 24 hours of what was really refractory hypoxia. Like you really don't see much refractory hypoxia like this, I think anymore in many other cases. Um, and we ended up withdrawing on her uh, seven days in. Uh, she was on 100% on APRV. She was on 50 of nitric. Uh, there was just no other therapies to offer for her. She had SATs at that point in the high 70s, I think. Um, and uh, speaking to her husband, we decided to withdraw on her. And that was a, a difficult communication situation, which I'll go into a little bit later on. He was in hotel quarantine as well. He'd come from the cruise ship too, and he was a COVID positive patient, although not very sick. Um, the second patient we had in, uh, you know, draws the sort of the big difference between the two patient groups that I've seen. So this was a 70 year old guy also from a cruise ship, Caucasian again, he had type two diabetes and no hypertension. He was intubated on arrival to hospital, although not quite as severe as, as our first patient. Um, again, low SATs, but he actually looked okay. And he got intubated uh, for, for the numbers really. Uh, again, makes you wonder whether you'd follow that same pattern now knowing what we know and, and, and maybe leaning towards using high flows a bit more and he really just stayed very very stable for, for 10 days with us you know he had he had reasonably high fo 2 requirements at about 0.5 and the, uh, you know, an interesting thing I saw, and I would be interested to know if anyone else saw this, but was every evening um, and sometimes into the sort of the early hours of the morning, we would see this dip in his sats and we saw it in a couple of the other patients as well and they would need to go up by maybe 10%, 15% on their FI2 pretty much every evening or early morning uh, and then would be back to normal the next day in most cases as well. And we saw that persistently with him for about five days in a row and a few others as well. And really the game was to try and stop people putting his peep up and doing other things 
in response to that like you might normally do for for ARDS or something similar um he was he was you know not that side to call start kind storm sort of picture he was very intermittently febrile but not that febrile and he was extubated on day 10 with no incidents at all wife was on a ward at the time so I had to go down and see her and talk to her um and he actually remains in hospital uh with a pretty he's, he's okay but he's got a very very significant postural drop and I haven't managed to see an echo of his if they've actually got around to doing one but um I know that's something I'd want to see and see what his echo looks like now because um he also had quite a long persistent low grade fi o2 requirement on the ward as well of just sort of one or two liters for another week or two on the ward um the third patient would be the one most i mean if you're going to put anyone into the sort of the h group or the cytokine storm sort of group that this was him so he was our youngest one he was a 42 year old uh, filipino cruise worker he was a, a chef in the kitchens on the cruise ship i think it was the italia um, and he was hypertensive and we suspected a bit of alcohol use, but, um, but we were never quite sure. And it was difficult to get a history because his wife was in the Philippines and, and there were some problems with that. Um, he had it, it just, we saw him on the ward and we always thought he was going to be someone who was going to get worse. And he got you know, worse quite, quite abruptly overnight and then came down and he looked the worst of everyone really. Looked was febrile with fevers of greater than 39 right from the word go. He, had the, he was the one person who had a very high D-dimer and a sort of CRP in the, in the 200s. Um, and he, you know, maybe looked okay for a day or two on, you know, less aggressive for the ventilatory strategies and then deteriorated quite rapidly, got put on APRV, got put on nitric on day three. He ended up getting proned on day four, developed multi-organ failure day five and was put on um, renal replacement. I think he was the only one of ours that we put, ended up putting on renal replacement. I actually didn't see that much AKI in any of our patients except for him really. And even him, it was really in the setting of just progressive multi-organ failure rather than sort of lone AKI. Um, although I did find when I was trying to drive people out as per the first sort of strategy that we were suggested that they seem to have much less fluid on board than their positive balances would know. And I don't know if insensible losses are raised in these guys. That was always something I was quite interested in. Um, he had clear right heart failure towards the end of his stay uh, but the, and was anticoagulated. But then again, in the setting of trying to prone him, ended up having a VF arrest and, and died after his VF arrest. Uh, again, on, on very, very extreme settings on APRV, FI2 of 100% and nitric of 40. Um, and that was, it was quite distressing, I think, for everyone involved there as well. Um, he'd been made not for uh, CPR at that point, just for the sake of futility, really, when he was on 100% and everything else was going downhill. And I think people found that quite, quite tough. Um, and our fourth patient, uh, again, she's, she's more of the stable sort of look. So she was a 69-year-old lady. Uh, 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 maybe BMI above 30, but wouldn't be much above 30, I don't think. Um, Caucasian lady with known hypertension as well. Um, intubated, she came from the ward to us, actually was the first patient we didn't intubate essentially on arrival or, or had intubated before they got to us. And we tried her self-proning with some face mask go to, I didn't ever, the nurses were quite uncomfortable with high flows after we'd all sort of spread the message that high flows were the, the harbinger of death for, for the entire unit. So that's, uh, but we had to sort of fight against that message after that. So that'll be good to have, uh, have Brad's experience and maybe, maybe change the feeling of that. Um, and she stayed very, very steady, a little bit more wiggle than maybe our second patient, Ken, but um, FR2 is in the 0.4 to 0.7. She got anticoagulated pretty aggressively, I think, um, towards the end, maybe a bit too aggressively. I think she had a little bit of a bleeding episode. Uh, was very briefly on nitric for a couple of days. Uh, she had a failed extubation, uh, which would be sort of fitting into what we were talking about before. I wasn't there for that. Um, and I know they didn't do a cuff leak on her. And that was a debate we all had afterwards of whether we, you know, whether that's something we should do. She actually had a pretty big piece of granulomatous tissue on her, on her, one of the left cords. Um, and that was, that was essentially caused a valve and she, she deteriorated very, very quickly after being extubated um, and got, got re-intubated and then had a, had a bit of a delay, as you might expect, to a surgical trachea that ended up getting done through ENT with a lot of debate as to whether perk trachees or surge trachees were the way to go. Um, and then was super steady after that and then got decannulated on day 21 after some scopes and, and seeing that the granuloma had resolved and she's doing much better and is discharged on the ward. So sort of 50% mortality rate and they really split into these two quite you know quite distinct groups and you could pretty much see it from the word go it felt like you knew who was going to do well and who wasn't going to do well um you know if we, you know again I'm not, I'm not sure how well everyone fits into these h &L phenotypes but I suppose I would don't think I'm not not telling anyone anything they don't know but you know this is not ARDS as we classically understand it and I think you know the, 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 certainly the the two that survived had extremely compliant lungs I'm still very interested in trying to work out how much of 
the conversion to the more severe multi-organ failure is related to disease progression and how much might be iatrogenesis of the some of the things that we're doing maybe potentiating some of that injury and, and maybe potentiating the injury in the lung and maybe making that get more of a multi-system affair but i think that's a, a bigger debate for another time um but what i really wanted to talk about um i think there's heaps of clinical stuff to talk about but i wanted to make a, a few points about communication because it was something i found coming up again and again and again so if we could move on to the next slide that'd be great Not listening, you see. No. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the, I, we, I had communication issues all across the board, really. So I was on uh, for a week on the COVID side of the ward um, at, at the time when we had a few come in, and we only had four negative pressure rooms. I think you know, twenty sounds a real luxury, and that was very difficult managing those, um, both in terms of the actual patients within them, but also trying to manage the unit with lots and lots of sort of you know query COVIDs coming in with some pretty soft stories and, and, and some pretty unusual uh, reasons for swabbing people and worrying. Um, the, you know, the things I wanted to touch on briefly, and I, I could talk on this all day, but I thought you have to stop me, but um, it, you know, from every perspective, really going into the room and, and you know, full PPE, especially when you're going in on your own, we were trying to minimize the amount of people going in and out of the rooms and full, you know, full PPE, putting that on, going into the room, it is a real barrier between you and your patients, obviously. And then admittedly in the first sort of week, we were keeping them more heavily sedated than we end up doing later on. Um, but it's often just you and the nurse in there. Uh, I found frequently in the first days or two, I would forget things on the way in. I got so, you know, you'd been so used to being able to double check things on the computer or getting someone to pop out and look at something. That was something that changed my practice. You know, I have moved towards having a checklist and actually making when the juniors go through it with me, keeping one of them outside as a spotter to do runs for me if there was things I forgot, asking if any drugs needed taking into the room, asking if anything else needed to be taken in for the nurses or anything like that as well. So I'd really recommend thinking about how you manage your workflow. Um, you know, don't take anything else into the room, obviously for, for infection risk and things like that. Um, and then, yeah, I suppose we touched on that before, but the inside to outside communication was, was really, really challenging, you know. So I think all the clinical situations become much more difficult when, you know, just trying to ask someone for something very, very simple, like, you know, some potassium or, or you know, some fruzamide or something, um, you know, is a, is a real, you know, ball ache of, of a minute of time writing on a piece of paper and holding it up and trying to tap on the window and getting people's attention. Um, but I suppose the time when that really flared up um was was in some of the sims that we did uh you, you know where where we had some you know real differences in perception of what was going on between the team outside and the team inside um and lots of difficulty with communication we tried lots of different things we tried uh, radios they didn't work we tried phones but the background noise was just too much but really in the end we thought that the best thing we found was either laminate sheets that you can you know use flashcards or just pads and just write on the pads as well but i think if you're in an emergency situation i would definitely name scribe and I would definitely make an effort to just close the loop on everything because people, you know, they can't get that, um, you know, the, the non-verbal cues that, you, you know, you're looking at someone and you're, you know, making eye contact and doing that kind of thing. And a lot of that is lost while wearing the PPE as well. So I was, I was sort of in the sim we had, I was sort of motioning to the guys outside. I thought with my eyes to say, holy shit, get in here. This is really serious. <laughs> they, they thought, the message they took away was, oh, Andy's making eyebrow gestures at us. So that was all really good. Um, uh, you know, another thing that I found really, really challenging was was managing the families um, and the next of kin in some of these situations. So the first uh, was it the first, yeah the first patient we had who was who just sort of progressively got worse and and died. That I came on on day three of her care and she died on I think day seven or day eight, um, and I was involved there. Her husband was in lockdown in a hotel, unable to leave the room, uh, and we tried to get him to be able to visit. And at the time, obviously, it was it was very very marked restrictions on that, and had some pretty strong debates about about of so that. But I, th I found that really really hard. You know, you, you you're you know you're 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 delivering bad news without any sort of feedback from that person as well. And I found some you know thoughts that would never normally cross my mind. Question about you know what, what, who who is this guy? He's on a room on in a room on his own. What's he going to do with this information? Is it do I have to worry about you know caring for him afterwards? And I was trying to contact the doctors in the hotel, and they were overworked. They weren't allowed to go into the rooms at the time to check on him. So I called up his daughter and a few other people and sort of looked after you know tried to find out a bit about his mental health and whether you know there was any risk of him doing anything in this very sort of extreme situation as well. But and that was absolutely heartbreaking, I have to say, telling him about his dying dying wife for 50 years over the phone and saying that he couldn't come and visit her. So that was re you know, really, really tough. Um, so I, I would think about that. And I would also think in, in that vein, just remember you're the only line of communication for these families to their, their patients. And I, and I made it a real um, 
point to call every single family every single day that I could, although some of those were very tricky because of being international or being in areas where, where phone calls were difficult. But if you can't do that yourself, I'd really recommend delegating that to some of the juniors or just making sure some message gets back to the family every single day. Because I think you just think of, you know, if that was you and your mum's in the unit, that'd be absolutely dreadful. And then in terms of other, you know, within the unit, the, the communication was, was very, very tricky, you know, especially in those first sort of, I don't know, a few, was it the few first few weeks of, of, was it March, sort of going into mid to late March when things were really kind of most heightened level of fear, you know, protocols were changing every single day, plans were evolving every single day. Um, and I think that led to lots of uncertainty and it, when it was, it was un real uncertainty because we were all uncertain as well. And, you know, you're making these plans and they're being almost released very, very quickly or people are hearing about them. People get misinterpretations of what, what some of the, uh, things being put in place are you know things being that were suggested for you know phase three or even four of a pandemic there were teams in the hospital certainly and, and, and nurses within our unit as well that, that thought that was already in place you know there were people asking us whether we would ever do cpr on people you know where you know what, what why things were changing in terms of non-invasive you know that caused a lot of a lot of consternation as well and, and and rightly so you know i think there was a lot of fear for the nurses themselves and what they were going to be exposed to especially when we're hearing about healthcare workers you know dying overseas um, and fears for their family as well. You know, they're, they're, you're putting these nurses in a very, very difficult situation. So I think you've got to make sure that you're trying to support them as as best you possibly can. Um, and just be aware that even if you maybe you don't have a, a, a concrete answer to some of these questions, just acknowledging the uncertainty and, and, and saying, yeah, I know, you know, this is really tough, can, can make a big difference. So again, I was trying to make a point of doing that as much as possible as well, just to sort of try and sort morale out. Because I think there were times when things were, you know, pretty fraught at times in the unit, especially when people were, you know, were passing away in the early doors as well. And then, you know, another big aspect was just communication with the hospital as a whole, you know, and just the, the hugely wide variety of responses you'd see. I'm sure everyone else had the same thing. You know, I was being absolutely barraged with any piece of information through social media or through email or, you know, and I, I was getting hundreds of these things a day from, you know, people I know in the UK as well as lots and lots of well-meaning colleagues here. But, you know, it was, it was, pretty exhausting, you know, wading through the amount of, of information, especially when it's quite low quality information as well. And you're trying to pick out the, you know, the, the signal from the noise a lot of the time. Um, and it was just, I suppose, from a point of view of someone who's quite interested in cognitive bias, it was really interesting watching those play out in real time, you know, watching the exposure to all of that stuff from international centers, which really wasn't our experience in terms of our lived experience. Um, but that become, you know, what certainly, I don't want to badmouth anyone, but you know, there were people in the ED, who I think it, it it was tough to move away from a, a perceived fear of it being everywhere, you know, at times and even we were already getting data in saying maybe it wasn't. And then the knock on effect that would have in terms of communication we would have and, and they would, you know, be, some of those would be quite, quite fraught as well. And they would feel that someone required, you know, red carding and full negative pressure and we would, we would feel slightly differently sometimes. Um, people were missing out on investigations pretty frequently at one point during that week when the fear was at its highest you know people who obviously would have got CTs or CTPAs or other things were uh, coming up to the unit with a pure COVID diagnosis and a seemingly very little differential in there um, and it, as, as you guys I'm sure know it was very very tricky to try and get lots of investigations once people were up in the unit so we, we made it a point then to make sure we were seeing people as soon as they came in and making sure they went went through the CT scanner if we thought there was a differential that needed removing. Um, and then, yeah, that's pretty, oh, and, oh, sorry, another communicator I would really recommend as well. It's probably going to be less of an issue now in terms of the labs with the new gene expert test and being able to get quicker turnovers for our, our, our patients. I suppose that might allay some of those um, sensitivity fears that people have got over the PCR testing, because I think the sensitivity of that's up in the mid to high 90s. Um, but uh, yeah, but chasing swabs, you know, when I was trying to manage the four negative pressure rooms and we had, you know, three or four, you know, pseudo COVIDs come in overnight. Um, you know, people maybe wouldn't have called the lab the previous day to let them know to put the swab through as urgent. So you'd ring the lab up that morning and you'd be told, well, it was not going to come back till four or 5 p.m. sometimes. And then you're looking at trying to juggle these beds and work out, you know, how much risk am I putting the unit in by moving people into single rooms that maybe aren't negative pressure if they feel like their their likelihood of having a meaningful COVID diagnosis was quite low. Um, so that was very, very challenging as well. And just trying to to skirt the borders of cohorting the entire unit and what that would imply for everyone's work practices and then meant the entire day and potentially in PPE and things like that. And luckily we just just skirted away from that, but it was a, it was a really challenging time. Um, yeah, so look, uh, 
blathering away, but I'm sure I'd be really interested to hear what other people's experiences were for that as well. Thanks very much for that, Andy. Um, the first thing that you mentioned that I just thought I might yeah. uh, throw into the group was this, whether anyone else uh, at the centres had this experience of uh, diurnal variation uh, of oxygen saturations. Mm. I mean, you have to be very astute to pick it up, obviously, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So um, I found that actually on my, my time there. So for, yeah, for some strange reason, um, they would desaturate around 6 to 9 p.m., I think. And you'd be like, why is this happening? You'll check over them again, but then they'll settle down again. Not sure exactly why that would happen. Um, is it positioning? Maybe. I mean, we were prone three in our unit. Uh, is it, you know, at the end of the day, they did de-recruit a bit, just lying in one position, maybe. Um, but not sure. But yeah, it definitely had that phenomenon. Yeah, I, I don't think it was de-recruitment because after I saw it a few times, I stopped, I stopped the juniors putting the peep up or doing anything to try and recruit up and we just literally watched it. I mean, again, it's hard to know for everyone whether that's going to be the case, but um, they, they, it's weird, isn't it? They just seem to hit and then fade away over the course of the next you know, four or five hours after that as well. It was, it was really interesting. You saw it time and time again. Yep. And I, I look, that, that happened to the ward patients as well. So the ward patients would go through fluctuations in their oxygen sats and oxygen requirements. So, you know, um, the ones who, it was interesting because the ward patients, the ones who stayed on the ward, they would fluctuate up to three, four liters, but stay there, but it fluctuate throughout the day between one and four uh, liters requirement. And the ones who ended up in ICU, they would actually go up a bit higher and then come back down. So it was, um, yeah, quite an interesting thing. Yeah, I guess I, I didn't really notice the timing so much. I did notice with positioning, certainly. Um, we talked a lot about this and with proning and whether to do proning. And we, we did do that with our the couple that were bad. Um, and we did notice quite a remarkable response. So like the, um, the sats in our chat would be 75% on his back without fail. And as soon as you turn him onto his front, it'd be 40% and be like that for the 16 hours or whatever that we left him prone. But we thought, and then, but as soon as you turn him back, they went back to the same. And so we thought, you know, it was consistent with them not being recruitable. That what we were doing was just sort of shifting, you know, we talked with John about this a fair bit, that these were just shifting west zones around and shifting perfusion and they're not actually recruitable, which, you know, at least in that early stage, but we still, or well, at least I still thought that, um, you know, being exposed to a lower FI2 for a large proportion of the day might lead to less lung damage from, you know, high oxygen sort of requirements. And so I still thought it was beneficial even if we weren't really recruiting patients and getting benefit that way. That was very similar to us, Brad. I think, you know, I, I had a sort of notional figure of somewhere between 0.6 and 0.7 FI2 in my head. And if they reached that, I sort of felt oxygen toxicity might be more of an issue and then you know maybe therefore proning you know will we'll take away some of that risk there but yeah it's it's a, it's it's not it doesn't feel like it's ever going to be a disease modifying intervention does it it's just a, a a holding pattern sort of thing can i can i just that in there did you what was your experience would you have tended to have gone down the aprv route before trying proning or I mean we tend to at fish with quite an APRV dominant unit whereas we've not we don't have huge experience of proning but would you have gone would you have proned before you've APRV'd your patients? Uh, Me or no, Brad? Either either. I think we're an APRV so I think we're an APRV state. I okay. I think um, the whole state uses APRV here and the eastern seaboard thinks it's um, a, a lot of, well, not all the eastern seaboard, but a lot of them think it's not it's the devil's work. But um, yeah, so we, we used APRV first straight up and then prone when they got worse. What, what are your thoughts on that? Because I mean, I'm, I'm normally incredibly pro APRV in general, but I do have worries in this cohort that you've got this, you know, this really distendable lung with, 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 a, with a, you know, a high compliance and, and whether you're in the I'm same not, way, that, sorry? You're stealing one of my scenes, Andy. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. No, no, I don't know anything about APRV and I go need on, someone to tell me some interesting information about it. Maybe, maybe there's someone who's an expert in those matters who might be here. I, I had a question, Andy, regarding the communication. Uh, basically, uh,
Yeah, basically, uh, you know, when we were preparing for the pandemic, and there were a lot of talk about triaging yeah. and you know admission criteria. Yeah. And we had some staff members coming and asking me, the elderly staff members, you know, nurses, ward clerk, one anesthetist, asking, Ravi, will you admit us? And and the effect <laughs> on look then you know it made me think you know what effect people have of all, all the social media news articles and then how we discuss within the unit and people pick only few bits of information and how they extrapolate to themselves uh, it really puts a lot of stress on people and uh, we probably thought very have to be very careful when we discuss all these issues. Uh, that was just one comment about you know communication. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you're entirely right, Ravi. I, I suppose uh, I shied away because it's a very difficult area, isn't it? But um, uh, I, I think the whole the, the whole aspect, both in terms of goals of care conversations in general for this, you know, a, a, oh sorry, I can hear myself in the thing um, where um, you know you're you've got an uncertain disease process that certainly does seem to have a fairly long intubation time and presumably that's going to have some effect on functional outcomes for these guys i, I always think it's pretty it's, it's not it's not it, it, in and of itself the mortality being that much higher in that older group although it is much higher in that older group that necessarily sees it puts you off but it's it's the thought that are you leaving these people to be respiratory cripples for the rest of their life because you know you think if you're if you're managed with two weeks of, of really high flow oxygen and fairly extreme settings with this much going on you know you, you, I, I don't know that we have a lot of outcome data yet but it, it seems fairly likely to me you're going to get some degree of lung fibrosis and I know they're seeing that some some of the CTs coming out of Italy and, and guys who have got this persistent now oxygen requirement out into the community for, for some amount of time um, and hard to know whether they're going to see now I suppose flip the flip side of that coin is is for the guys I had that didn't go on and, and become sort of cytokine stormy multi-organ failure type guys they didn't seem to fit a sort of normal uh, picture of sepsis where they, you know, they got a lot of catabolism and, and, and failed away a bit. They actually seemed to maintain muscle mass pretty well. I had one of my guys very light and still doing exercises every day before he got discharged and he was, he was really, really good. Um, so, so I think it's, it's very hard to know, isn't it? Because uh, especially when we were intubating early, you know, maybe, maybe if, if you get a bit more of a picture of how the disease trajectory is, if you're using, having people on high flows for a bit longer, maybe that allows you to have more of a, a meaningful discussion about which, which trajectory they're going to take. But, um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's really, really hard. And then I agree that the, we had very difficult conversations with staff as well around the triage issue. I think it's a very um, emotive and tough issue to talk about. Um, but my, my conversation with people was always really, it's, it, it, we're, not, we're not limiting anything until we have to limit anything, you know, um, and, and, if if you've got you know a, a large amount of, of resources still available for people regardless of of their age or comorbidities you you need to have a, a, a meaningful chat with that person and, and and think about what their outcome is and whether it fits their goals um if there comes um, Ali, a time I'm stop you there, there's, yeah. a, there's a few issues you just <laughs> mentioned that we are, we are going to get to um so uh, i might at this point just uh, <laughs> that was my nice way of doing it um so i might just in, uh, introduce yeah we talked We're about gone. we've talked about this um, in the pre meeting. So uh, Jude, uh, Jude, you, uh, you are up. Um, uh, I'll mute us and off you go. Jude, you just on mute there. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Hi. Hi, I'm Jude. Um, I worked through at uh, Jin Lop Health Campus during the um, the Atenia um, cruise ship and other cruise ship patients coming through us. Um, I've left out a lot of tables and numbers from my presentation because I just wanted to focus on themes, but I would I will mention a few things as we go through. Uh, Brent, can you go to the other slide? Uh, yep. So uh, in total, we had 41 patients uh, in hospital and they came from uh, three separate cruise ships, mostly from the Artania. Um, we had 10 admitted to the intensive care. All of them were over 65. The oldest was 81, average age for about 73. 
Um, they were all intubated early except for one. Now, the, the early intubation was based on um, intubation triggers that were set in preparation for uh, the um, evolving pandemic, I'd say. Um, the one who was uh, delayed, we tried her on high flow nasal prongs, which she didn't tolerate at all. Tried her proning herself while she was awake. She didn't like that. And then tried her on CPAP and BiPAP, but she got intubated after about 16 to 18 hours. Uh, we proned three patients and uh, two were put onto Iloprost uh, NEBS through the circuit because we don't have the equipment for uh, nitric. Um, three patients died. The first one died within 12 hours of admission, and that was um, just profound cardiogenic shock. Um, so he came in, he was actually never hypoxic. He was on Romaine saturating high 90s, and he just had profound shock, heart not doing much, and then he lost consciousness and got intubated and then died about eight hours afterwards. Uh, the other two, the, um, the care was actually withdrawn with, because of progressive multi-organ failure. Um, they had the typical markers with very high D-dimers, procalcitonins over 200, and um, just had really bad ongoing multi-organ failure, and we withdrew on them. Six were discharged, and they're, they're now back in Germany as well, and one still in hospital with a complication I'll talk about um, in further slides. Next slide there, Brent. Um, so the, the, the things I want to talk about that we saw with our patients uh, before we get to the themes are one, uh, weaning off the ventilator, and it, it brings in the question, the tracheostomy as well. So uh, the range of patients on the, on the ventilator, the range between three to 11 days, and I'm not sure what you guys saw in your units, but the last two days were usually that of a slow wean. So, you know, Andy was talking about this variation in SATs. I found in the last three days of their intubation, it was actually difficult to get them to minimal settings. Because um, the settings they were at were settings I would intubate them on. So it was, a, it was a bit of a difficulty. And everybody was really nervous extubating someone to non-invasive and high flows, which uh, played, in, played, in, uh, played a factor as well. Um, in the last two days or three days of, of them being on the ventilator, they usually entered, that's when they entered the diuresing phase. And we'll get to the, the fluid balance and acute kidney injury later on. But when they first come to the unit, all of them were very, very dry. So all of them had hemoglobins over 160. All of them, sorry, nine out of 10 had acute kidney injury as well with the you know, creatinine is just over what, 120, 130. And all of them needed filling with no deterioration in their respiratory requirements on filling them, which was quite interesting. Um, initially they had minimal sputum production, uh, but then they started producing a lot of secretion, you know, two days before uh, they ended up extubating. Most usually had some form of mild delirium, which again, all of them ended up on some dexmedetomidine. And um, throughout their intubation periods, all of them had sedation holes. And there was a question, you know, going forward, whether we would do sedation holes if we were overwhelmed with patients, because if you have, you know, a two to one ratio or three to one ratio in nurse to patients, you can't really do sedation holds that safely. Uh, we extubated two to high flow nasal prongs. Uh, the rest were extubated to uh, nasal prongs successfully. And um, none of them had cuff leak tests. With regards to the acute kidney injury, um, eight out of the 10 patients had some form of acute kidney injury. Six resolved quickly with filling. Uh, two progressed, and uh, one ended up on, on renal replacement therapy, but he was later, um, care was withdrawn because of uh, worsening multi-organ failure, and the other one was palliated as well. Uh, with regards to the myocardial dysfunction, so six out of 10 patients uh, had myocardial dysfunction of some sort, whether it be um, LV impairment, septal impairment, uh, on bedside echo, uh, six out of 10 patients had it. Five out of the 10 patients had a troponin rise, uh, which was significant. So it went up for a couple of days and then uh, declined. Um, of those five, all had arrhythmias. So we had AF, SVT, one guy who luckily had an internal defibrillator, had ongoing episodes of VT. I think that saved him really. Um, and the, the question when we had you know, those patients in there is one, if we do have a patient with, with you know, severe myocarditis and shock, and I think Anthony alluded to this question, and it'll be a question for the intensivists in ECMO centers, 
is there a role for ECMO retrieval in those patients? And it's, I don't expect an answer tonight, but it's something to think about. And whether any of you guys had an experience or thought about minim minimally invasive cardiac output monitoring in these patients, because it'll be quite useful to know what their lung water is and stuff like that, to know what their true fluid status is. Um, because sometimes, you know, transthoracic echo or, or is, is not, is, you know, you have difficult views or you can't do toes because of exposure. So something to think about. Pulmonary emboli. So we talk, spoke about this with, with Tom's talk. So uh, three out of 41 patients had PEs. Um, the, you know, why they ended up getting scanned. I mean, the, the, one, the one from the intensive care unit ended up getting scanned because he had pleuritic chest pain, which a lot actually had some form of pleuritic chest pain, which is put down to them having, you know, a viral pneumonia, really. Um, someone asked a question on the, on the forum whether, you know, if you scan all of these patients, whether they would have, have PEs. It's a good point. I mean, if I scan everybody in this room, some of us will have PEs as well. So um, is there a utility in scanning them or not? And then we need to decide what we're going to do regarding anticoagulation as well. Complications. So uh, the complications we saw, so one of our patients, she had um, a ventilator associated pneumonia. So she ended up with enterococcus in her sputum. And interestingly, so uh, Andy, you mentioned that when you extubated your, your patient who failed, she had a granulomatous tissue around blocking. So this lady, I had to actually do uh, a bronchoscopy on, emergency bronchoscopy. And she had this ball valve um, phenomenon occurring with this sputum plug slash granulomatous tissue at the end of the tube, um, which was quite interesting. Luckily, I didn't have to change the tube, just ended up suctioning it out, um, but it does happen. So it, it seems that they lose a lot of um, water from their lungs. So I think you know when a person is on the ward or when they're infective and not intubated, they actually dry themselves out a lot with insensible losses. So by the time they end up intubated, they end up with some sort of hemodynamic compromise um, and actually need filling. Uh, the other patient ended up with a, a central line associated bacterial infection, or presumed and possibly infective endocarditis. So this is a guy with the um, internal defibrillator who ended up growing enterococcus in his blood. And uh, that'll come down in, in the next slide when we talk about uh, sterile procedures. Um, but the thought is that it possibly did occur during central line uh, either insertion access use and um, because he has metal work in there, he's been treated for infective endocarditis. So he was kept in Australia. He's actually still in hospital, just on IV antibiotics. And until that course finishes, he can't go back to Germany just yet. Uh, next slide there, Brent. So in terms of the themes I want to talk about or bring up, or bring up uh, I guess the first one would be with logistics. So having a dirty ICU and it's... Um, it, it, was, it was a difficult thing for us because we only have three, well, two negative pressure rooms and one isolation room in the intensive care unit, and that's rapidly filled. And especially with these query COVID-19 patients coming in, I mean, everybody's going to have a fever this winter and respiratory symptoms. Uh, those rooms are going to be filled pretty quickly. So what we did, we, we, we called enough our intensive care unit as a dirty ICU, which involved you donning and doffing outside the intensive care unit, entering the intensive care unit and spending, you know, uh, 12 to 14 hours in that space um, in PPE, which is not that comfortable. Um, so one, it, it had a huge effect on staff and staff morale, I would think. Two, it brought into question what we do for procedures in terms of the sterile procedures either have to go outside, scrub, come back in, which is, you know, takes a lot of time and, and resources. Or sometimes, you know, do you think, I guess staff was, were, were, you know, reasonably anxious to um, take any garment off in that dirty ICU to scrub. So it was um, it's something we, we need to think about going forward. And cross-contamination. Now, the, the, the nursing staff and even doctors, because you're in this dirty area, going in between patients, you, you usually have the same mask, head cap, and under, you know, gown on, really, and you change gloves in between patients, but the risk it definitely is there for cross-contamination. Um, and going forward, although we don't have any cases of, of new COVID patients coming through, 
The question would be with these query COVID-19 patients and possibly a COVID patient, if we do that again, are we gonna cross contaminate patients in there? And how are we gonna you know, utilize our resources to the best of our ability? Um, with regards to tracheostomy, so there are several questions I'll list off. So one, should it be done? Two, timing of it. And three, discharge, destination, and direction. And I'll, I'll, I'll go through each. So um, should it be done? Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but tracheostomy for respiratory failure usually has a poor long-term outcome. Um, if it's done in these patients, um, you know, the risk of tracheostomy care in intensive care and going on to the wards is very high because we know these patients have viral loads in their lungs for, you know, a reasonably length, reasonable length of, length of time. And are we exposing staff um, to that if we do tracheostomize a patient? At Jundalup, it's difficult to get an, a trache patient for other than respiratory failure patients to get them to the ward. So usually a tracheostomy patient is stuck in intensive care or high dependency until they're decannulated. So that would be a huge thing for us to consider whether we do tracheostomize a patient, whether the wards would ever be happy going there. It'll take a lot to upskill the wards and make the, I guess, the ward staff comfortable uh, to look after these patients as well. Um, timing. Well, with the course of disease, the disease with our patients, with our 81-year-old guy, I was thinking, you know, throughout it all, when do I consider whether I track, you know, do a tracheostomy in this guy or not? And my thinking was I probably wouldn't do a tracheostomy on him. I think I would wait and see how his course, you know, progresses. And that's what we did. And I think, is it, is it that we actually need to just give the patients more time? Because if they're going to get better, they're going to get better. And, you know, being stuck on, an, on a ventilator with an endotracheal tube in, versus tracheostomizing them early to in an effort to get them out, is, in, is, is that truly in their best interest or should we wait to see how they progress? Um, and you know, that's a question. Of course, each patient is, is individual and you have to base it on that, but that's one of the questions that, that came up regularly. With regards to AKI, I mean, we went through that already. Um, usually multifactorial, definitely part of the inflammatory response syndrome, shock, Fluid balance, I think most of them were dry. Um, whether they do have microthrombi uh, in there as well, and the role of anticoagulation in the AKI, um, it's a question yet to be answered. And we'll only know this question, I think, after all the data is out post pandemic, really. Um, so those are, my, um, those are my points there. I'll just open it up to the panel and see what, um, if you guys have any thoughts or questions. Thanks for that, Jude. I, I know, Brad, you had um, uh, some experience in cohorting at Charlie's. Um, do you mind just expanding a little bit about um, some of the differences at Charlie's? Uh, you're on mute there, Brad. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, we are also, you know, have a relatively old ICU in terms of the WRCUs, and so we don't have a lot of single rooms. And so I did have to cohort early. We did make one of the sides negative flow, which means sort of turning the air conditioners around essentially. Um, so it wasn't negative pressure, but we did encounter a lot of the same issues that both I guess Andy and Jude have discussed that, you know, when you're in a single room and there's not a lot of people walking around, I mean, they, they made at least three nurses be in that side, even when we got down to one patient, but communication becomes a really big thing. Basically, from a PPE point of view, we, we also put our, we put our suspects in the cohorted area, but in single rooms. So what that meant is, is, is that you don your PPE, you go and see the suspect, so you, you not, haven't got COVID potentially on you, and then you can go and see the COVID positive patient because they've already got COVID, but then you can't go back to a suspect patient, then you've got to go out doff again and and it does mean you know you do wonder about patients getting you know getting seen as often as they they would do and um you know all the, those things that we've discussed about but uh i don't think and if we do get a second wave or whatever i don't think we could do it any other way except for cohorting tom i know at fiona stanley there was a, a, a sort of um different approach and that sort of um 
one of the advantages of having um, predominantly single rooms there. Um, can you just expand on what was done at Fiona Stanley in regards to, I suppose, cohorting? Well, this, the suspect patients still were cohorted into pod four initially. Um, and we were then left with the difficult situation of patients who were then sort of cleared from COVID, but having been in a COVID area. So they were then stepped down sometimes into pod three, which had been cleared out when it looked like we were going to get a lot more patients during the sort of when the Artania was there, they cleared out pod three of all the non COVID patients and tried to move them down the unit. So pod three effectively ended up empty apart from patients who are occasionally stepped down from pod four to pod three. But I think just touching what Brad said, I think it, it caused a lot of sometimes anxiety amongst the patients actually, who were well enough to be aware of their surroundings and well enough to be aware that they were effectively within five meters of this new global pandemic virus. And I think it was a lot of risk for them, particularly the low probability non-COVID as it transpired patients. And you could see that there was a lot of anxiety with them and there was probably a lot of anxiety with their families as well who were being phoned up saying you can't come and visit because they're in a COVID area. Um, so that's kind of the way it worked at FISH um, with regards to the sort of, sometimes you have to step people down to the sort of non covid but still isolated area and again like you said julian we've got the had the luxury of single rooms and a fairly empty unit we were you know at one point in time at about 25 percent capacity i think so sort of 10 patients at one point in the 40 bedded unit we might just um briefly change track for a moment um jude um you sort of briefly touched on the patient you had with um fairly fulminant cardiogenic shock um, do you mind just giving, I suppose, a 30-second sort of summary on the natural history of that patient? And I think we're actually lucky enough to have Caitlin um, still on um, the panel there. Um, so maybe we'll start with you, Jude, just to give an overview. Yeah, sure, sure. So see, he was, um, he was a 73-year-old chap, and he was from a Celebrity Solstice, actually. Uh, so he wasn't from Artania. And uh, he came in, and he, was, he just had viral symptoms for just a few days and um, he came in because he collapsed. Um, the day he collapsed, he actually had no respiratory symptoms. No matter how hard they pushed him to answer those questions, he had no respiratory symptoms. That day he came in, he just collapsed at home and he was brought into hospital and he just rapidly progressed to just severe shock. So he was, he was brought up and um, you know somebody had the idea, oh, maybe we should actually uh, put this guy in isolation and maybe, you know, treat him as a, as a COVID. So he came up to the unit um, where he was echoed and it showed just biventricular failure. He ended up on um, industrial strength, inotropes and vasopressors. Um, and then uh, he actually lost consciousness, ended up getting intubated for airway protection at that stage, really. Um, and then just slowly declined despite supports. <laughs> Um, just off the um, top of your head, can you remember um, what his troponin, et cetera, were? Yeah, so his was, his, his, I think his was about 459. Of course, this was within the first six hours of, of, of coming in. Mm -hmm. um, his ECG, I can't exactly remember what his ECG showed, unfortunately. Um, but yeah. Caitlin, any thoughts on that? Yep. Yeah, Jude, can I ask you, how, when was his first onset of uh, any viral-like symptoms? Uh, it was three days before. Three days? Yeah. Cool. So in, in the, the literature, there have been reports of multiple um, presentations with myocarditis with COVID, and the presentations vary. So from one end of the spectrum, you have the typical respiratory patient coming in with shortness of breath, cough, et cetera, having the pneumonia and then developing the myocarditis, you know, at day 10 to 14 afterwards. And that may be associated with the cytokine storm. And that's, you know, I think that could be one presentation. There've also been, there's, a, there's been case reports of patients who have come in with no respiratory symptoms in terms of having no cough, um, a patient, uh, a middle-aged lady came in with having some fatigue 
and some shortness of breath over a couple of days and that was it and she actually had um, a chest x-ray that showed some um, that was clear she had a CT chest that then showed um, some infiltrates and she had an echo for her uh, fatigue and the echo showed she had moderate LV dysfunction and within the presentation in ED she developed hypotension like your patient and went into needing inotropic support. What is interesting with the patients was um, there've been reports of having on echo, LV function may not be so bad in terms of the ejection fraction, it's not severe, like it's less than 10%. What they've seen is EFs have been predominantly, it could be just mildly impaired. So with a uh, mildly impaired or even sometimes normal EFs, the LV size has been smallish or slash normal, and there's been LV wall thickness and edema. So how much of it is like a restrictive um, filling so that you don't have that cardiac output? So if you were to do a right heart cath, you'd probably find that the patients might have a cardiac output or cardiac index of less than um, two liters. Mm. And the other interesting thing is um, the patients may not report significant hypoxia but their lactic acid may be very high. And in New York, there was a series, four case series presented in, in circulation, which suggested, to, which suggested that, um, that patients may deteriorate rapidly um, with just that initial presentation. So that's, I've showed you two extremes in that you had patients had respiratory symptoms then developed cardiac symptoms. And then you had patients who may have had a, um, a couple of weeks down the track might have had some respiratory, very respiratory symptoms initially, but then had very vague non-specific symptoms and still had the myocarditis. There have been also cases of patients who have the typical ST elevation that you would see that we would call a STEMI, and they came in with myocarditis. The troponins um, have been reported to vary between, um, it's sort of marginally elevated, so that's just above normal, so 26 and above, to um, being in a couple of hundreds. Um, and the there has been a correlation with the serial increase in the troponin and the rate of the troponin rise and the clinical course for the patients. So it's interesting to hear that your patient had a troponin of only 459, yet um, he succumbed pretty quickly. Can I ask you, um, when you said he lo had loss of consciousness, was that a PEA event or was that an arrhythmic event? Uh, no, I think he just, um, he was that hypotensive at that stage. I think he just lost consciousness, yeah. No, it wasn't, it wasn't an arrhythmia, no. So oh, he was just, um, just hypotension despite yeah. all the tropes? Yeah, yeah. And his initial, his initial troponin, just looking at the figures here, so his initial troponin from ED was 11. And yep. then we repeated it, yeah, um, a couple hours later, it was 450-something, yeah. Thanks, Judy and Caitlin. Um, we might move on to Brad. Um, Brad, you've still got uh, 63 punters watching. Um, good luck, mate. <laughs> um, just before I start, it's a very quick thing about, practical about the trackie, is that um, we did find, we did put, a, we only put one trackie in and we put a standard Portex in, and then we found pretty quickly that he had a leak around that and had to change to an adjustable flange. And it was, he looked like a nice neck, but um, we just sort of decided that from now on, we would put in adjustable flanges because just the risk of having to do a tracky change versus, you know, deflating the cuff and being able to move the adjustable flange up and down in patients that are likely to have a bit of tracheomalacia is probably a important thing. So that was, yeah, was relatively relevant. Um, all right, so um, thanks, Brent. Um, so these are the things I was going to touch on quickly. It was just, um, again, similarly how it is a bit of a different disease um, and what, what that response to CPAP meant sort of for the disease pathology. I will touch on our high flow, as a few people have commented on, and, um, and then a little bit of ventilation and some non-COVID morbidity. So um, I guess we, we've all sort of aware of these different phenotypes um, but uh, it certainly by far seems to be the most the common theme and at least initially of this sort of L type or normal sort of compliance hypoxemia low recruitability state and um, I think we all think you know because the parenchymal side isn't that bad at least on imaging and 
not as bad as the hypoxia, that there must be something going on in the vascular side. I've seen, probably a lot of you as well have seen sort of people talking about similarities to, to high pressure, to high, high altitude pulmonary edema. Um, and, and there's a couple of trials registered already looking at acetazolamide and ephedipine. I'm not sure if that's correct or that useful. I think, um, you know, that's a case of sort of excessive hypoxic vasoconstriction. Um, and I think this is more a case of sort of dysregulation or loss of that normal hypoxic sort of vasoconstriction. But, you know, it's a little bit hard to know, but um, I certainly do think from the, res the response to CPAP that we saw in our two patients, uh, and I'll talk about that in a sec, that there has to have been some sort of edema component. So, um, Brent, you can put uh, the next slide up. Um, the, the patients that we had, so these, these are just the ones, so not a couple of these didn't come to ICU, but these are all the patients that we had. We managed a few, I guess, with relative high flow on the ward as well. So I think we had about 20 or maybe a few more come through the hospital, but these are the ones that we were particularly involved with. And um, you can show the next slide, Brent, still it's just a highlighted to the two. So they're the two that we intubated. Um, and so the first guy, he would, he'd been with us for a few days on high flows. Um, his SATs were sort of sitting 85, 88% and we elected to sort of semi-electively intubate him. And putting him on 10 of CPAP, his SATs went straight from sort of 85 up to 100%. And then the next chap came in overnight when I was on, he was... Um, he was on a non-rebreather and nasal prongs with the ambulance, essentially took him straight to ICU. He had a peak SATs of 57%. And I put him on five of CPAP. Um, just, and, and look, I was just using the CPAP in these scenarios, which I have done previously, just for a pre-oxygenation tool. And put him on five of CPAP. And again, his SATs went straight to 100%. Now, I don't know any other condition that, except for pulmonary edema, that has that remarkable response to CPAP. You know, I, I can't imagine it was just the FI2 because they were essentially, you know, close to 100% FI2 or whatever, you know, with what they were receiving beforehand. So I don't, and they weren't clinically overloaded. In fact, they were probably dry. Um, I echoed both of them after intubating and they both had normal hearts. So I don't know if it's, and I was thinking maybe it is just these, they're taking big breaths, maybe it is negative pressure edema to some degree in the setting of leaky lungs. But um, I just thought it was remarkable that how, how well they responded to CPAP, almost tempting to leave them, but you know, that it was, we just used the CPAP as a pre oxygenation tool. Um, so I guess touching on the high flow side of things, so we talked a lot about this at the end, when we went through the ANSIX guidelines as well. And essentially, we settled on that that's what we would normally do for hypoxic respiratory failure for patients pre ventilation. And we thought, and, and that's the thing that has the most evidence. And we thought that's probably the thing, you know, that's what we do now. That surely should be the thing that we should do from a clinical point of view. But then there's the question of staff safety. And I guess it's hard for me to know whether a patient who's on high flows in a single room who's self-caring and moving around and doesn't need a lot of intervention is more or less of a risk than intubating a patient early. Um, we looked at, so I looked through all the studies and from, you know, a lot of it's from modeling data. Uh, and so that's hard to go on, but the models suggest that the sicker your lungs get, the less dispersion of the droplets you get. And the other thing is if you put a surgical mask on over the nasal prongs, you sort of go back towards the dispersion of droplets to, towards normal nasal prongs. So I guess in, in that setting, and we sort of put some trust in the PPE that we thought that would probably be what we would think we'd want to do for the patients. Um, and hope and probably, and we, you know, what we were available, what we we're aware of would be safe for our staff. And I think the UK stuff is encouraging like the, it looks like the healthcare worker infections are actually following population trends, not work exposure trends. Um, there was a paper recently on 106 health worker deaths and um, there were no anaesthetists and no intensivists that died. Um, and, and basically virtually not very little of the high exposure risk groups. Um, and it just seemed that they were following the population trends. 
It was more concerning that the ethnic minorities seemed to do worse, and that seemed to again follow population trends, and that was a discussion point. But look, I think, you know, from what I've seen, I, I think we're relatively happy in this area, and I think we probably did avoid intubating some patients. You know, from what we've heard from Tom, you obviously all your patients got better anyway, so maybe maybe intubating might be protective even. But I think that's where we felt we were, what we settled on. Um, and then, yeah, I guess that from a ventilation point of view, so we sort of, we put both our patients on APRV early, and we found what others are alluding to, that just from the, the, the um, just that how good their compliance was, um, and I guess I like the APRV, and, and we all do it, Charlie's, and I see it more as a, a really good mode for recruitability. I think a lot of the studies that haven't worked with recruitment manoeuvres is probably because you do recruit a bit of lung when you do it, but you probably just lose that over time, whereas APRV is constantly recruiting. And I, I'm just not sure whether you need that in the early stages of APRV, so we, oh, sorry, early stages of COVID. So we sort of found like you'd started at 30 and then their volumes would be over 100 and then you're rapidly getting it down to 20 and their volumes are still sort of six or 700. And you, you can go to the next slide, um, Brent. I'll just show there. So with, with the Dragers, as we've got the ability to set the, the release time to the expiratory flow and we set it normally at 75%. And normally with ARDS type patients, I never actually really have to worry about the time low that much. I set it at 0.5, but it never really is the thing that's, you know, it always cuts off before with the 75% thing. But with this, it was because the compliance was so good, they were still, it was, it was 0.5, you know, it was actually time limiting. It wasn't the, the 75% the 75 was too long. And so then I'm finding I'm having to give them peak or shorten it even further. And then essentially I'm just sort of moving towards a mid-range CPAP. And then I guess I'm not sure, you know, then you're probably not going to see that much difference to, to a you know, peep of 10 low tide of volume type strategy. So I'm not saying I, I still um, think it's a good mode and I think we just have to think about how we use it. Um, I'm just not sure it's the, it's, you know, and I think when, when they move to the H type and the, the or whatever the, you know, the standard, and at RDS, that's when I think, you know, it is a very good mode. Um, and I guess I was just interesting to, interested to hear how other people set the APRV. And, um, and, and you know, it sounds like we've probably used about 10. Importantly, we're, we're looking at those patients now with the WAVE study. So it's, um, it, that'll provide, hopefully provide some important information. Um, and then maybe I can, I don't know if you want to go around and then I can just touch on the last point about the non-COVID mortality, Seb and Julian. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Just to, just to add, um, add a little uh, comment um, here from the, from the audience, uh, from Prithvi saying, uh, most patients had very compliant lungs needing standard ventilation. They need only select patients, not in everyone. APRV and very compliant lungs seem to hurt some patients. Thanks, that really. Um, Andy, I might, uh, you talked a little bit about APRV earlier. Um, just uh, thought I might throw that question of Brad's to you about setting APRV. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, look, uh, we don't have the auto 75% setting, and I, I found exactly the same problem that Brad's alluding to, that, um, that uh, especially when they were breathing on top, it was very hard to set it. Uh, with a time low that felt reasonable. The volumes were always much larger than I'm comfortable with. Um, well, until maybe the end of the end of the game for the two that sort of flamed out. Um, and, I, and I just wonder what good you get. I mean, for me, it's, it's, a, it's a recruitment mode, you know, and I, I think there is recruitable lung, I think, in these guys when, you know, there is, the, I think there's this crossover between uh, an endothelial issue, a pulmonary vascular issue, which probably involves the endothelium as well, and some degree of thrombosis. But I'm sure with that injury to those endothelium, there will be some vascular leak. And I'm sure, we, I mean, I think we all know from the CTs as well, you, do, you certainly do have some areas of, of parenchyma where the, the lung water looks a bit heavier. And the French with the um, extravascular lung water using the PICOs have said the same thing too. Um, but yeah, I, I, they, they aren't difficult to recruit. That's what I'd say. You know, you're not dealing with you know, like a bad ARDS lung where you stick them on the APRV and you see steady improvement over three or four days. I, I think you see that improvement almost instantaneously. And I think then the danger is if you're setting it with normal rescue mode oxygenation settings, then unless you really know what you're doing, you know, you, you, you can have people having absolutely enormous tidal volumes on 
what must be at risk lung with all that inflammation going on. And I, I, again, I do wonder about how much, how much of the conversion might be iatrogenesis, you know, as, as part of it. Um, and whether, whether harm is, 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 is a risk of, of doing these things. And I guess, do you need to, is the other thing, you know, like I, I love it. I love APRV, you know, I think it's a really fantastic mode, but I just think in, in, in these guys where we don't quite know what we're dealing with, I think doing it as a reflex for hypoxemia maybe isn't, isn't the best option. And if you do put it on, I think you need to be very, very careful about weaning down those settings very quickly, probably over the first six hours. They're not people to set them on 30 and zero and walk away for the night and give them 12 hours on that. I think you, you, they'll get in, you know, they'll get in, in trouble. Yeah, look, I'd agree with that as well, Andy. So um, the ones I had on APRV, so once they were intubated, going on to APRV, they actually weaned quite quickly. So some, only some of our ventilators have the, um, the cutoff with the percentage flow. Uh, so the ones without it actually had to set a PLO to prevent them from totally, you know, emptying the alveoli. Because I think, you know, yeah. going along the lines where they had, um, you know, the concept of patient-induced lung injury, either on high flu nasal prongs or NIV. I just don't want that atelectatroma, I guess. So I did have to set PLO on them. But saying that, they actually all weaned quite, quite quickly and ended up on either SIMV or CPAP. The ones who ended up on the ventilator for about eight to 10 days, they actually had periods where they needed APRV. So I think they, they ended up having that um, recruitable lung, you know, being there after eight to 10 days, whether it's, you know, just positioning or whatever. But I think either they, they actually ended up getting into that um, stage of, you know, early ARDS. Um, Brad, you mentioned about the pulmonary edema. So um, I echoed everybody who was on the unit every night when I was there. And um, it's interesting. So intravascularly, they, they, they were quite deplete. But when you do a lung ultrasound on them, it's obvious pulmonary edema. So it was, actually, it was actually a nice balance between filling them. And then, you know, in the later stages, days afterwards, then you can start drying them out and drying their lungs out. So I think there's definitely, you know, element of pulmonary edema in there. What, what were people's feelings on inhaled pulmonary vasodilators? Because I had really high hopes for them before we started seeing patients just from the, you know, the pulmonary dysregulation point of view. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't end up using epiprostanol or Flolan in, in anyone, although I was, I, quite, I was quite taken by maybe the antiplatelet effect and the thrombosis in the lungs and whether that might have a sort of side benefit. But not, nitric, uh, once it was on, it was hard to wean because the patients that were on it were getting worse and they were hypoxic, you know, and it was difficult to then take it away, even if you, were, you didn't feel it did an awful lot. But I wasn't, I wasn't blown away by the effect of the nitric. It seems if there is dysregulation, it doesn't seem like there's areas where there's normal pulmonary vasculature that you can get you know, access to. We yeah, used... I agree. Um, we, I mean, we used it. Uh, it maybe helped a little bit, but I didn't, yeah, I didn't see as, as good a response as I guess I'd hoped. I did see some, we did see some response. We use prostacycline and uh, it bought us a lot of time for the patient. When you say bought your time, Ravi, did they end up surviving or? Yes. Uh, Brad, did you have a few more points that you wanted to make at the end of, uh, uh, at the end of your talk? You sort of stopped a little bit and let us. Yeah, it was also fun. Yeah. I do like Luke's comment. I did just say about um, I did basically yeah stop thinking of APRV as a recruitment mode and just just that it was a, a pressure mode and it's just whether you release for ventilation and have a mid range CPAP or you start low and have a slightly higher pressure. So I think it is fine to use. I just think we need to not think of it as our recruitable ARDS because this is not basically ARDS, not not in the way what we think of ARDS anyway. Um, yeah, I guess the last point I just wanted to talk about was non-COVID morbidity. Um, I'm just aware of a, of a few sort of adverse events that with sort of COVID related practices that may have contributed. I'm aware of a few, you know, like we saw delays to STEMIs, you know, to angios and patients with STEMIs. And I'm sure, um, it, I'm sure it shifted my focus sometimes and I miss things. There's the PPE issue of not going to the room as much. And I guess I just, and, and I saw CPR, I see CPR as a good example of this, you know, that the, 
most places are saying that it is an, is an uh, airway, aerosol generating procedure. And I can't not see, you know, if we're going to be putting on saying you have to wear PPE for CPR, I can't not see there being significant delays in defib and CPR compared to what was prior to this and their lead and us seeing increased mortality in patients that don't have COVID. And I guess our pro I think our priority for the future is going to be that um, we're going to have to come up with some sensible approaches that really balances patient safety and patient outcome and staff safety. And I think that's a really hard thing to do. Um, and I think uh, because, because although COVID hope maybe we've better beat it in WA, maybe we won't get much, but the PPE issue is not going to go away. And I think that's, that's going to be our, our big thing for the future. Yeah, I mean, we, we certainly saw lots of, I mean, I, I called it COVID collateral damage because you saw patients coming up, you know, with one diagnosis being given, no differentials. And I had, I had a big PE that got misdiagnosed and then, then found late. I had another guy who ended up being a neck fash who was admitted, you know, w with fever from a drug den. And he, you know, he was labelled as COVID with really no no thought whatsoever put towards his. And then it, that next day, you know, there were certainly delays to being seen by the surgical team and by some other teams as well because of that as well. He ended up not doing very well. So we saw we saw a lot of that, I have to say, um, as, as the fears got more heightened. And I think strategies to, as you, you're spot on, Brad, I think trying to find strategies to, 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 to limit, limit that damage to patients from, uh, from concern is, is really important. Uh, Tom, I know you had a point to make about uh, FOVID morbidity as well as, as, well as uh, Fiona Stanley. I think it's been similar to what Brad was saying. We've had a few cases of um, patients, particularly one who kind of had that perfect storm of delay to definitive treatment and then isolation in a room for low probability COVID and then a delay to a resuscitation and ended up with a poor neurological outcome because of probably all of those cumulative effects. So we've definitely seen a handful of fairly significant morbidity from it. Um, but I think it all comes up. I mean, it has to come with regards to who you test and you still have to follow policies. I think that's the hard thing. So I don't know how we're quite going to work out solutions. Um, in the immediate phase of trying to reduce that morbidity. Um, but we've, we've experienced it, I'm sure, just as other sites have, um, to, a, to, to effectively mortality with one patient, probably a big contribution to that. All right, well, we might move on from uh, fluid morbidity on to a little more uh, about uh, clearance um, of COVID. Uh, Ravi, um, I might get you to Come on and um, have a little chat about your experience um, down from Rockingham. Uh, Ravi, you're still on mute at the moment. Okay. Can you see my slide? Okay, basically uh, we had only one patient and today was his uh, 40th day in ICU and the patient was decannulated today. So uh, we had a lot of lessons to be learned. And one of the advantages was we had only one patient and uh, everybody focusing on the same patient. So the patient had a typical course. He was a 60 year old male from Ruby Princess. Wife was COVID positive. Patient became COVID positive, came with respiratory failure. And he had a background of uh, previous ischemic heart disease and a couple of stents. So his initial three to four days were really stormy. So it came as hypoxic respiratory failure. We had an intubating team, got intubated in a negative pressure room, <clears throat> went on APRV and uh, inhaled prostacyclin. Within the first 12 hours, it developed a complex shock with a cardiac index of uh, 0.8 and uh, uh, echo suggestive of Takosubo with elevated troponin. And the patient became aneuric and we electively put him on uh, renal replacement therapy to manage his uh, fluid balance. 
within the next 48 hours it developed a pneumothorax i think next 24 hours he had a pneumothorax with icc and that was his uh, first you know first week in icu uh, towards the end of the first week uh, he had three swabs which came back as uh, three endotracheal aspirates which came as uh, pcr negative as the patient was improving then he started worsening again and he had a pseudomonas in his chest started on meropenem but continued to have refractory hypoxia uh, he got a ct scan of his chest around day 8 or day 9 which uh, suggested uh, diffuse crown glass appearance and some areas of consolidation and we were not sure what what it could be it could be the wap uh, we were not sure so patient continued on meropenem uh, but still had refractory hypoxia and uh, day 3 we had to prone him that was uh, towards the end of second week we had to prone him and uh, he continued to be on uh, aprv mode and inhaled prostacycline so in spite of proning we could gain you know fio2 of say 0.1 or a uh, 0.5 uh, like 5 or 10% of fio2 and that was with around uh, 16 hours of proning which was hard work for the unit because we had to keep one consultant uh, for one patient at night time to help with the turn head turning after 4 days of proning we were kind of stuck because uh, there was no improvement in the oxygenation as soon as the patient became supine his he would steadily climb climb up with his fio2 requirements and then we discussed with id respiratory team and uh, the consensus was patient was around more than 2 weeks after the initial covid three swabs negative on antibiotics we considered Uh, giving him some methyl prednisolone as a last ditch effort for the by this time the patient was a uh, single organ uh, after the initial anotope requirement the patient also had upper limb dvt and uh, he had a ejection fraction of uh, less than 30% in the initial echo so we initially gave methyl pred for 3 days high dose and he started improving in his oxygen requirements and we discussed amongst the consultants and as a consensus we thought there is enough excuse to start him on low molecular weight uh, heparin so we put him on low molecular weight heparin and within 3 days he started improving with his oxygenation and soon was switched to spontaneous mode of respiration by end of week 3 he had developed critical illness weakness and we were finding it difficult to wean him off the ventilator and him being cleared of uh, you know three swabs negative we plan to do a percutaneous tracheostomy which went uh, very smooth and now next couple of weeks patient had another hit of wap and then went downhill treated with meropenem and finally he was weaned off and decannulated today now another event that happened was when he was getting weaned down and when the time came to put him on a high flow tps we consulted id again regarding you know whether it was safe to put him on high flow tps in a single room which was not a negative pressure room and the id advice was to uh, swab him again unfortunately uh, the swabs came back as positive and uh, the two upper respiratory swabs which came positive and a tracheostomy swab which came positive and that set off a flutter within the unit because the patient had been had been on droplet precautions but you know patient was considered as covid negative and that started an intense debate within the infectious disease infection control and us about what meaning to give to these swabs the advice from infection control was to shift the patient back to negative pressure room 
however they mentioned that they did not think it was infective or uh, they could attribute some importance to these positive swaps they thought it was just viral shedding however the question was you know why would you shift this patient to negative pressure room if they don't think it is infective and uh, the staff got very anxious and basically almost all of us got swapped almost 50 50 staff members got swapped thankfully everybody came back as negative so basically this was our challenge you know you had three endotracheal aspirates negative and everybody assumed that the patient is covid negative and then after say 15 days we swap them again and the tracheostomy swap comes as positive this is where the anxiety came now we could look at it in three ways you know we look at the evidence what does the evidence say what do the experts say and then we can have some logical discussion from evidence there is not much of evidence there are only few letters to the editors with small uh, small uh, studies done by patients uh, done on very few set of patients one uh, letter which mentioned uh, that the viral load of sputum from nasopharyngeal swabs uh, was compared to the sputum swabs so uh, basically our infectious disease thought if it is only upper respiratory tract positive we can't put much importance to that however there is you know some data which shows that viral load from the sputum is correlating with the nasopharyngeal swab then there was one letter which mentioned the viral load in asymptomatic patient was similar to viral load in symptomatic patients now here for this patient there was no antiviral treatment that was given so even if the patient had Im improved from system wise respiratory wise we could still consider him as asymptomatic carrier we were not sure what it what the meaning was now the sensitivity of the bronchoalveolar lavage was the highest and this patient had again a tracheostomy swab Tracheal, tracheal aspirate which was positive and that was more concerning for us so overall in literature people do mention there are many reports which suggest that there is viral shedding however uh, there is no clear consensus that they are not infective so people are wondering whether it's just non-infective particles or reactivation of infection or or real reinfection and then what are the implications on clearing these patients now it is very uh, unusual for people to swab after three swabs are negative and then swab them at week four and that is something to consider going forward you know especially so this was what the evidence is what the experts mentioned that is our infectious disease and infection control at heart they don't think it is infective but their advice is to be safe and keep the patient in negative pressure room. Now, there are many patients who got discharged and never swabbed from ICUs and we don't know really what was their viral load or what was their you know, PCR status. For our patient, we convinced the infectious disease to get a viral culture and we'll get it after two weeks. And uh, we hope that the cultures don't turn out to be positive but if they come positive there will be some implications in how we dispose these patients now i guess uh, you know we don't have an answer i don't have an answer the infectious disease don't have an answer but you know i would like to know what what are your thoughts about uh, clearing these patients Yeah, that's tough, Ravi. Uh, I don't know. Um, you'd have to assume that's dead virus, I guess. But why would you have pick up dead virus that far down the track? I, I don't know. That's bizarre. We had a very similar sort of experience. Not, I mean, not as bad as that, I don't think, but similar experience of needing multiple swabs to clear people, people who clearly were positive, coming up negative. 
So we were treating anyone who we we broke people up into sort of high clinical suspicion, and they were just assumed positive. And we retested them until they came back positive, which they all did eventually. Um, and people with a low clinical suspicion in our, you know, we were somewhat pragmatic about if we didn't think they had it, and they gave us a negative swab, and people would let us get away with it, we would let them go to the ward. Um, and there was a few that we got some pushback on where you'd have to do, you know, another swab. It's we we were generally two negatives, and they were happy. But yeah, I'm hoping the gene expert test is going to take away some of that problem, to be honest. Yeah, Interestingly, so, this on. patient's wife was uh, declared negative by the public health. And then she had a repeat swab positive. So then she, she visited the patient and then she was quarantined again. So we had the, the wife of one of mine was on the ward she had uh, far, five or six negative swabs, but she still had x-ray changes. And, and obviously her husband was in ICU with it. And so they just, she kept on saying, she kept on saying like, I keep on testing negative, but they won't let me leave. And I was like, yeah, I think that's going to continue for you, love. But, but uh, yeah, tricky is, I think clinical suspicion seems to be almost, you know, more of a clinical suspicion plus investigations that are non-PCR related. I think you have to build up a, a picture you know, make some sort of Bayesian prediction of, of how likely you think this really is, don't you? Yeah. So, 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 so Ravi, from, um, from our point of view, the, it took a while to clear any of these patients really. And, um, to clear or to, to have a patient de-isolated, it shouldn't look, um, it needs to be more than seven days from the onset of symptoms. Uh, if I well for more than 24 hours, um, no symptoms for 72 hours and then two negative swabs taken 24 hours apart. But as I said, you can do two swabs that come back negative and then you have a figure that comes back positive. Um, but that's what we're relying on. And, you know, you're going to, if, if we do get a large amount of numbers, you know, resources are just going to be consumed, you know, quite quickly. I think just from a fish perspective, we've had, we've had similar issues with, we've had negative swabs, but we've had persistent fever. And that's led to a fair sort of discrepant, fair delay rather in clearing formally from ID. And I think the bacterial infection probably has contributed to that persistent fever. And we've certainly had, I mean, our mean time, our median time to ID clearance was, you know, four weeks with some patients taking five days on top of when they had their two negative swabs to be formally cleared. So we've certainly had those issues um, in Fiona Stanley. Guys, thank you. Thank you very much there. Uh, there is clearly, this was not supposed to be a, uh, a catch-all evening. This was supposed to generate discussion um, and you definitely have. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I would encourage any of the people that are watching, if you still have questions, please email them through. Um, this has been, we've had 65 people um, watching this webinar from across Western Australia, all the way from Broome to, uh, to Albany. So thank you very much for everyone that, uh, that watched. Um, and as I said, thank you to the panel. Um, thank you, uh, especially to Kate and Lam for coming along as well and, uh, and taking part. Um, and also thank you very much for your support, ANZICS, uh, particularly on the tech side of things. Um, you guys can't see uh, Brent, who is in Melbourne, uh, who is very much driving a lot of this tech. Uh, but yes, Brent, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. And um, yeah, we will end the evening there. But again, thank you to the panelists. Can I just say thanks to Julian and Seb for organizing this and a great job, guys. Well done. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, guys.